All right, welcome everybody. Welcome Zinger Nation. We have a brand new show. We're doing value investing. I got my my man Robert Betts doing. How we doing, Robert? I'm doing great. How are you, Aaron? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so actually, you know what? Let's do. Let's let's start off with our little uh, our little intro video. We usually do it for Power Hour, but it's it's a nice little intro, so I want to go ahead and play it. Let's get ready to rumble. Zinger Nation jam packed show today. Peloton of five percent. What's up, discipline investor? We got Benzinga CEO Jason Raznick here with us. The man, the myth, the legend, Tom Nash. Peter Schiff on the Power Hour with us live today. Interesting, different, unique, innovative companies. Mia, you are live with us on the Power Hour. What's up? Thank you so much for inviting me on. Jessica Billingsley is the CEO of Aperna. The best trade idea resource out there. I'm excited. Drilling, oh, pumping. There we go. Yeah, that's why That's why we play the video. It just gets you pumped up, you know? Um, so, Robert, let's start off. Can you tell tell our audience a little bit about yourself, you know, your job and degrees and background like that? Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, degree, uh, f- degree in finance, um, emphasis in uh, entrepreneurship. Right now, I'm doing uh, wealth management. Um, so, a lot of mutual fund, ETF stuff, but uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about does go into that as well. Um, yeah, uh, besides that, uh, just... Pretty much had an interest in finance from a young age, uh, probably about 14 or 15 when I started getting into it. Um, and, uh, you know, my family, my, my grandma specifically had a lot of finance stuff. I remember asking her about stocks, but, you know, she's always like, I have a money guy. So that's a lot of the older people kind of, that's their that's their response. They leave it to someone else. But I had an itch to learn more exactly about what was going on. And I'm sure as a lot of people are that are watching, um, they didn't really know exactly where to start, and they kept saying, you know, technical analysis, fundamental analysis, et cetera. So um, I had can to kind of – Sorry, real quick. Can you just take us through kind of the difference between uh, like technical trading? Right, and, um, yeah. Trading? So so technical is going to be looking at a lot of the stuff like um, basically how, how the charts are mainly the technical – um, you know, like moving averages, et cetera. Fundamental is really going down to the, how the business works, the balance sheets, how the money's moving in and out, um, the underlying business itself. Um, what I do is value investing, which is really where you really look for uh, undervalued companies, companies that are trading below what their intrins- intrinsic value is, which is would be um, – there's a bunch of different ways that you can look at to see what that is, but you know, Warren Buffett does it. Um, a bunch of big hedge funds people do it. Michael Burry, big with the GameStop stuff. That, you know, he did that stuff. He or he does do that. And, uh, and we're so. going to talk more about kind of what they do and what we can do to kind of not do exactly what they do, but right. emulate them to try to find undervalued mm-hmm. stocks in that, in that regard. Uh, I think the biggest point is, especially right now, what we're seeing with, you know, as hot as the market's been, especially during COVID and all the stimulus checks coming in, people having a little bit more money to spend. They've been doing uh, stock stuff. I'm sure you guys probably saw a surge of uh, people watching your shows, et cetera. Um, try, I guess trying to see how they can get an, an, an upper hand to everyone else, all the other retail traders. So, um, I do think that the, being a value investor and saying you're a value investor, especially you know, uh, as as one of the younger guys, uh, it's people kind of scoff at you a little bit. And I've there's I've been seeing things online like uh, uh, Warren Buffett's old or outdated. He doesn't really know what's going on, um, especially with the growth orientation, the growth focus on the stocks. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think value is very very important. I think it's something important that people need to start incorporating, especially as we shift into this very interesting phase of the market. I mean, we've seen volatility recently that's uh, been interesting. People aren't really used to it, um, and especially uh, a big thing is like FOMO, uh, fear of missing out with their buddies. You know, picking all these penny stocks, or someone says, "Hey, you know, I made so all, so and so on this trade," and you know, you're kind of like, "Well, why didn't I do that?" Or you look at something and you see this guy that's had success to start pitching the stock. And you're like, yeah, I need to get into it. I need to throw some money at it. Um, and honestly, that's one of the best ways to get burned. And hopefully we can teach you a little something today to uh, just have you uh, look into a business and try to understand it a little bit better. And I'll show you some resources, et cetera. Um, just give yeah. you a little bit of an upgrade. So, I, so from what I understand, you were uh, paper trading in the, before you turned yeah, so, 18, like when exactly. you first started learning at that young age. So I used to want to do stuff with computers. And then I told my, I told my dad that I was interested in investing and he gave me, uh, this book called the intelligent investor, which was written by Benjamin Graham. Um, and Benjamin Graham basically was the one who came up with this idea that you buy a company for less than it's worth. Um, a big point that these value investors use is they say buying a dollar for 50 cents. 
is uh, is basically the over underlying idea. So you buy buy a company that's trading cheaply. Um, and again, the the hard thing that I try to figure out is like, you know, what does that look like? Um, or is there anything specifically that you can look at that tells you that that's true? Uh, we'll talk about some of that, I think, later. But um, there are a couple things that you can look at. Um, but uh, I'm getting off track here. But the main point is um, – oh, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Oh, yeah. So, well, I, I pulled up the uh, the heat map we got here. So mm -hmm. I think one thing it would be helpful to do is just kind of go through – um, right so what we're looking at here yeah and um, like so what you see what, what pops out to you right so what what i like to start with is i like to start with uh basically under um, performing sectors um so sectors that obviously year to date what we're looking at here is a year to date map um these red ones that you see are going to be the ones that are down for you. you can see the per percentages and that's where i really like to start so i don't really like to go when i hear something's up 15 percent. i'm not really big on it, jumping on it that's not necessarily saying it's it's a bad pick but yeah, um, I tend to I tend to feel that once everyone started to see it, you're kind of missing that momentum on it. Um, again, technical analysis would be that they they have some sort of screener that starts seeing that momentum when it ticks up, and that's when they hop in. Um, I like to understand exactly why that momentum's happening. That's kind of where I try to take my trade. So um, I do find that when you go to these undervalued things or these things that are underperforming, um, that's where you can tend to find a lot of value. Um, because uh, as Michael Burry put it, he says that uh, Wall Street likes to throw babies out with the bathwater. So once something starts to underperform, a lot of people start to dump anything that's in that sector. So, uh, for example, uh, when, when Canada legalized marijuana or weed, uh, they, uh, they had a bubble that burst or not burst, but they had a bubble that pumped everything up. And then, and then when it burst, everyone just was like, no, nah, I don't want to do anything to do with weed. Don't want anything to do with weed stocks. And then I thought going into the upcoming election, uh, I thought that people were kind of overplaying Trump's chances of uh, re-election. So I bought some uh, uh, marijuana ETF, and that played off pretty well. And then it, uh, again, we saw a little bit of hype right after the GameStop stuff with the Wall Street Wall Street boys kind of pushing, or Wall Street bets um, guys just pushing up some stuff. Uh, you saw like AMD or AMC and stuff like that get popped up. And we got kind of got into that bubble. So I hopped out a little bit early on that. I think it, we saw a little bit of a correction in terms of just how hot it was and then it fell back down. So I still think it's an interesting sector to look at moving forward with all the Democrats and stuff going in. So, um, yeah. But, and then so I know we, we talked about kind of the difference between technical trading versus yeah. fun, a fundamental trading. Um, but there's also a difference between like value investing and growth growth investing correct i'm oh, sorry one more time value value investing value versus growth right yeah so there is so um if you look at a lot of the growth plays especially that uh technology i think we had a really hot technology market um it wasn't necessarily in terms of balance sheet balance uh sheet strength or uh or the underlying business it was more about you know how many people are coming how many people are using the product how can they keep using that product etc um so i mean the, in my head when you think about that is like yeah facebook so uh, facebook's a good example is like yeah, facebook's hot but i mean there's regulatory risks etc with that especially the bigger they get um i mean they have a pretty solid balance sheet now but uh just something like that you, it, there could be something else that comes out so i mean for example like myspace when facebook came out myspace was the hot thing um, and with technology, these things are just popping out aggressively. So uh, the company being a sound company, um, having a good balance sheet, uh, management running it, all that stuff's insanely important um, just because that growth's not necessarily going to be there forever. I mean, there reaches a point where you can't, you can't continue to do as well as you were because, I mean, like – there's got to be a, a stage where, I mean, not everyone can continue to get Facebook. There's a limited amount of people. I mean, sure, more people coming in every day. That's why they started scooping up, you know, Instagram and WhatsApp. And they just started diversifying. And when you see that, that's when you start getting those value aspects come in. So it's not just about uh, how many people are using it. It's the underlying value of products they have, et cetera. So uh, like so, I said, technology, that was big, um, seeing those, those numbers grow. Yeah. Um, but again, like you might have really good revenue numbers, but I mean, if you did it all with debt, I mean, all that money has got to go somewhere. So, yeah. So what's yeah. kind of like your first step? You're trying to find a company that you would consider under Yeah. So, uh, I use the screener. So on here you can see, uh, I'm using, um, Finviz. So you can go to the screener right here. And I, as you can see, there's actually a tab for fundamental and technical. So, um, I usually start with my fundamental, 
Um, and then there's a bunch of ratios that looks like a bunch of gibberish. But the nice thing about this fin visit, actually, if you mouse over it, it will show you um, a basic explanation of it. So what I like to see is I like to see these margins, which is going to be, uh, I'm sure everyone here has seen Shark Tank, which is going to be basically how much money comes out of your revenue that you bring in. Um, like it says here, total sales revenue minus its cost of goods sold divided by total sales revenue. Sounds like a bunch of gibberish, but I like to have that positive. So that means that when they're when they're actually selling something, uh, they're making money on it. Same thing with the operating margin. I like to make these positive. Um, and then, you know, you start seeing things pop up here. So we can just click on Apple and I can click on some other stuff here that might be important to see. Um, so in terms of actual balance sheet stuff that I look at, uh, this quick ratio right here. Um, this is basically going to be anything that can be uh, liquidated within 30 days. So if this is over one, that just means that they have more assets than liabilities that are due within 30 days. Um, and then the current ratio is going to be uh, the quick ratio, basically, but also, well, sorry, the current ratio is going to be current assets with current liabilities for 30 days. But the quick ratio doesn't include inventory. So the quick ratio is a more conservative version of the current ratio. Um, there so uh, and then and then you can look at the debt to equity it's it's a very simple actual uh, the the debt to equity is basically going to be uh, for every dollar of equity they have how much of it is funded by debt so in this case this is Apple uh, for every dollar of equity they have a dollar and seventy cents is funded with debt now you in your head you might be thinking that's bad but as we know Apple's got an insane amount of cash so uh, them actually making those interest payments on that debt isn't too big of a deal because um, the underlying business is very healthy and then again those short-term liquidities if you know um, stuff hits the fan they're able to they're able to deal with those pretty quickly um, and people do say the PE I know a PE is kind of hit or miss um, I don't really tend to, to let it affect me too much. Um, uh, again, it, it, it kind of varies business by business because, um, you know, with the, the whole GameStop situation, they, um, you know, they had a negative PE, they had negative earnings, but um, fundamentally there was an underlying interesting uh, situation there um, that, uh, again, fundamental research, if you really dug down and looked into it, I think it was pretty um, enticing. And You're talking about GameStop right now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to give the audience some background. I mean, Robert and I actually worked together at a uh, wealth management firm. Is that how you can say it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, I just help people with mutual funds, ETS. But like Aaron says, we were talking about, uh, we threw some stock picks around. And so, yeah, last summer, so almost 12 months ago, about like 10 months ago now, probably around like May or June of 2020. So we had already seen like some recovery in the, from when the market crashed uh, in March from COVID. And, um, we were, we were working and Robert's like, yeah, check out, you know, GameStop looks, looks real nice right now. And it was at $4 and this was like before, I mean, I'm sure Rory and Kitty was doing YouTube videos and stuff, yeah. but it was before it was, he was big on YouTube. He was probably yeah. only getting like a couple hundred views. Right. And, um, so I'm curious, kind of like we can take that specific example and see like, what were you seeing in GameStop at that time? I mean, I know. We, yeah. We, so, so my big thing was, uh, I'm a big fan of the, uh, the big short movie. Um, which obviously is about uh, Michael Burry um, and the housing crisis in 2008. And so I remember reading um, a bunch of Bloomberg articles, et cetera, about just GameStop just closing stores aggressively, you know. And it seemed to be that the uh, the, the 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 main thesis was that, um, you know, that they're going to go out of business. And then I got an update that Michael Burry was going to be stock trading again, uh, which he had stopped doing after the 2008 financial crisis, obviously, because it was um, – um, pretty intense for him having to have all those uh, credit swaps, paying the premiums, people demanding their money, et cetera. So um, I looked into his holdings and I saw that he had GameStop. And so I was like, well, obviously there's something there. Um, and so obviously my first thing was, well, everything's going to go technology. You know, Netflix took out Blockbuster. That's what everyone was telling me when you looked into it. But um, the underlying actual aspect of the, the video games in terms of movies were pretty different. Like I had tried to do a streaming thing for, for video games and I mean, it was a mess. It was hit or miss, uh, barely worked. So I knew the technology wasn't really quite there. Um, I heard, just look at the download numbers, look at how many more games are being downloaded over the, uh, over the, uh, uh, yeah. So, so it's like, uh, download games over the physical games. 
And uh, I noticed that all the numbers that were being reported were, were cloudy. It was including microtransaction games. There was a lot of digital um, app stuff. Um, so yeah, I so went, like every 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 phone game that someone downloaded on their app right. was being included because in the, the. Most of the articles were, were referencing the Statista, which is a it's I mean it's a great resource, but I mean if you look to see where they're pulling their numbers from, they they disclose that in there. Um, so then I was like, all right, well I'll go look at the actual video game companies and see what they're saying in their earnings or in their uh, financial reports, um, and they did the same thing. So if they had a game that came out, you might have bought the game physical, but then if you bought any DLC. Uh, if you used a Game Pass or anything like that, then um, then they included those numbers in there. So I mean, you were seeing pretty close numbers for download and physical, but again, those it was pretty muddy. Um, I think the only one was EA had um, they they did their physical and digital, and their physical tended to be um, I think just barely over the digital, and that's that was actual actual game sales. And again, the GameStop was cyclical, so uh, we're at the end of a console thing. So you're seeing a bunch of these flash sales, et cetera, going online. So um, I think actually, in terms of the physical downloads, at least me personally, I still went to the GameStop just because my internet kind of sucks. So I know I couldn't actually download everything, but um, I'm seeing some comments here in the thing. So uh, Habel. How about Talim Kena said, do you not invest in new IPOs that don't have positive ratios? So, um, again, those ratios I was showing, I don't necessarily completely go off of these ratios. Um, I, I kind of make a pros and cons list with them. So, you know, for example, uh, yeah, uh, Apple seems pretty leveraged, but I do know they have a lot of cash. So that is something I'd want to keep an eye on, but I wouldn't necessarily uh, not invest in them because of that. So... Um, when it comes to those IPOs, I mean, it's still hit or miss. I would still do your research. Uh, look at those initial offering documents. Um, for example, uh, Airbnb coming out. I was I was a little bearish on Airbnb before being a t being, it being a tech company, but when I actually read the underlying um, reports, I mean, it, they saw a surge during coronavirus because it was secluded. So they're actually still be able to still run the business. And obviously with all the states, that some were open up and some weren't. Um, I thought there was actually some value there, um, and I mean they're still there. I think they're trading pretty high off their IPO still. So, um, yeah, I mean IPOs. I'm not I'm not hyper big on IPOs, but I'm not necessarily don't invest in them. Um, and again, one of the big value investing points is invest in what you know. Um, and some people take that as like you know I buy Coke, I should buy Coke, which is yes that's true. But um, I also think it's if you're going to buy a company, know it inside and out. So the price, if you know you're getting at a good price. Um, the price shouldn't really affect you because what you bought in at, if it's under it, um, you're going to have track again. So basically the whole thesis behind value investing is you want to have a margin of safety. And that really comes back down to buying a dollar for 50 cents, like I said earlier. And uh, so if you do that and the stock goes down, um, as long as fundamentally nothing's changed about the company, uh, you scoop up more shares. You're buying a dollar at an even greater discount, um, and so. Uh, sorry, so I see. I see. I saw another question in the chat that was asking about sector rotation. Do you have a Do you have a way um, in particular about like looking right, at that? Right. So, so um, again, you can use this heat map on here to see the shifts out. So um, a good a good. Uh, indication that we're seeing right now is obviously people moving out of technology into to the Dow, which is actually, you keep seeing that the word value thrown out. Um, but uh, I mean, like it, it doesn't really, for me, I'm, I don't really make plays just based off of that. Uh, I would look at this heat map and I can see kind of what's popping off. So banks are going off right now. Um, and then technology is actually still doing pretty well right here. Let me see Google this. I think they do this off of market cap. Oh, it's S&P 500. Um, so, I mean, yeah, in terms of that, I, I, you can look at those underperforming sectors. That would be kind of a way to, 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 to see where money might move later. Um, again, that's what this heat map would be year to date. Um, the value, again, is going to come to stuff that's under – undervalued or underperforming to the market, um, there's going to be value there. And so that might be a good way for you to actually see um, where money might shift later and kind of try to pr predict 
um, kind of predict where, where smart money is going to go. Because, uh, again, another issue that we have right now is we have a bunch of very uh, sector-specific funds that are going to get money coming. And so Michael Burry kind of touched on this a while back where he said ETFs are – overused i think etfs just and passive investments just overtook you know actual money managers um but um i think that you know with those very sector specific ones you're going to see it's it's harder to actually navigate and make specific plays trying to ride the momentum that's going to go into the technical analysis but i mean again if you invest in what you know if you're really smart with the technology stuff and you understand it um, you know, you can just look at, you know, the NASDAQ and just look at s funds that are underperforming in the NASDAQ for that year um, and see exactly what's going on. But um, there's some more stuff coming in here. Do you look yeah, at the well, percent think... change of the day? Um, again, I, I don't I usually use the screener and I punch in the stuff that I like. So, again, I'll look for stuff that's pretty low leveraged. Um, I may I may look at, at uh, year to date underperformance. I, again, there's nothing specific that I look at. I usually read the news or keep my ear to the ground. And if I hear someone that's um, if I hear someone that's saying something, I'll look into it and see if there's actually underlying value there. Um, so I think what we, what could be cool right now if we did is if we I want to take a, a a specific stock or company from the chat, but it has yep. to be you know a certain market cap. It has to be at right. least let's say one billion or two billion dollar market cap. So because you know some of the smaller smaller cap stocks don't really have those financial numbers the ratios for us to look at from a kind of from a value investing perspective um and then we can kind of take that stock look at the ratios um you know i know it, you don't have one single ratio or a couple right. of ratios that you always look at and use um airbnb i don't know if, i don't know if they have um enough to, would, would airbnb <coughs> have enough fi oh, walmart would be good to do yeah we can do walmart that's a good one and i do like and walmart so, so, i think walmart's gonna have uh i think they're they're probably the best competitor in terms of retail for amazon um really comes down because of their the amount of money that they have and obviously they're everywhere um and they have a pretty good sh stranglehold on uh most communities in the united states but yeah we can take a look at them and see kind of what my process would be so if i were to look at walmart are you able to see my screen here uh not right now i think you have to reshare that window or tab and i'll be able to pop it i can also pull it up in benzinga pro if we need if we perfect need. yeah if you want to do that i i know you you just set me up with that so i was gonna try to run down with it so i would um, look at the first thing i would look at is i would look at the 52 week performance on this so i do see 52 week range is a hundred dollars to 153 so uh, this even tells you about 20 percent away from the 52 week high um usually if stuff's trading close to the 52 week high um, this kind of goes to a technical oh, there we go aspect, yeah we got it up now but, um i tend to i tend to be that tend to falls into one of the con um columns like i said there's nothing i specific look at i kind of try to make a pro or con list so let's look um, at the ratios though and see kind of like which ones we might be able to yeah. gather some information from and then which ones so, we can kind of I like I like Finviz cuz they they're kind of color coordinated here so I do see the price to sales is is a good ratio there so um their sales are 50 559 billion which is massive um I look at book value as well book value um simply put is basically if they were to sh shut shop right now pay off all their debts etc um, you basically get $28 a share. Um, so you'd be at a loss right here. I do like when companies are trading at a discount, uh, a discount to book value. Uh, GameStop was one of those. Um, and so, so for instance, right now, Walmart was trading at $22 a share and this book value was saying, what is it? 26 it's, or 28. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you can see, so, so example, that's a very, very conservative, uh, way to look at it because that's not taking into account you know walmart as it is you're not talking about sales growth you're just saying fundamentally looking at everything on the thing everything on the balance sheet if they were to shut up sh shut shop sell all the assets sell the liabilities pay all the bondholders 2874 um, conservative what you get so you can see this is trading at about five times book value um, just about which I think that's that's pr that's pretty conservative actually considering um, at how big walmart is um, some concerning things here, the quick ratio, again, that's going to be everything but inventory um, and the current assets. So let me actually get this balance sheet here pulled up. So Yeah, and then I, I see someone else asking in the chat kind of like what type of trades we'd, you know, as far as like a day trade, swing trade. And these right. are, 
Um, so yeah, what would what would you say? For uh, that? Very uh, honestly, a very very long term aspects um, for these trades because basically what you're doing is um, when you're buying these things at such a discount, the market's most likely not looking at them. So you're you're going in early. So I mean, a, a great example, Michael Burry. If you look at the housing crisis, I mean, he started doing that in 2006. So it was about two years early, um, but. Yeah, when, when you get it, you're not buying in at a high point. You're buying in at a steep discount, ideally below book value. And, and they're being, especially right now, uh, most of my trades that I'm going in, the very slow movers, uh, more long-term holds. So, um, again, I was going to um, pull up this balance sheet just to give you guys some more yeah, context I'm as to what I'm talking about here. And then what we can also do is if we could hop in the spreadsheet and open up or and start one for um, Walmart, kind of go through what yeah, what absolutely. kind of what you would do there. So uh, let me get this pulled up. So but yeah, let's current, first look at that. Oh, that's that's the wrong. That's that's the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my boy Benjamin Graham, the value investing. Oh yeah, he, we'll there, put so. the link. We'll put the link for the book because we yeah. I mean there'll be lots of people that are want to rush so, to read the book. Just to, just to provide some context, so that book value um, is going to be total assets, total liabilities. So that quick ratio is going to take these current assets here. So you have cash, accounts receivable, which is cash owed to you, inventory, prepaid expenses, and investments, and then minus these current liabilities. So that's accounts payable, so bills they have to pay, notes payable, so it's be like interest on the bond, accrued expenses, and deferred revenue. Um, so the current the current ratio that we saw at Walmart is uh, 0.8. So that means that they, they have about 20% more liabilities than assets. And then that quick one's just taking out the inventory because uh, inventory is not necessarily something that they can get rid of quickly. It really depends on the company, um, what they have. Walmart could probably get rid of their... Um, inventory pretty quickly since they're just general goods. So that quick ratio being 0.2, let me switch back to that. Um, again, isn't necessarily concerning because of that. There's so uh, their underlying inventory, um, I think has, has, has the value there that you don't really need to consider that quick ratio. Um, so again, that's what I mean by it's, it's really contextual what you're looking at. Here. Right, you just kind of have to take it on like a case by case basis exactly. with the company, with the and stock. I, I also like. I mean, this is showing up as red. Uh, these 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 ratios for the the debt to equity. So again, that's for every dollar of equity that they have, about sixty two percent of it is funded by debt. Walmart again, uh, pretty sound company. So then paying those those debts not bad. And especially right now, post COVID, we saw a bunch of companies become more leveraged or take on more debt for the equity. Um, so me seeing this one right here, that's not concerning to me at all. Um, what I would want to do is I would I would definitely start forming questions on Walmart. So I'd, I'd want to see especially how their e-commerce did during um, COVID. I'm sure they had great numbers there. Um, Which so yeah, I know I know um, Walmart expanded its kind of e-commerce shipping capabilities during COVID. I, I think in some places right. they even offered like so, same day same day grocery delivery to compete with Amazon and Whole Foods. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind for me is that it's like um, you have the value aspects of the, of the company and their assets, but there's also could be a growth aspect as well there too. Right. So I think some people were putting up this, uh, looks like a, a DQ in here. So maybe- Is that Dairy a, Queen? Uh, I don't, could, I think, uh, I don't know. Let's see. Let's look it up here. DQ. No, so it's, it's, this, it's an energy, it's an energy company here. So first thing I look at would be the 52 week range. So- uh, 130. So we're not really trading too close to that 52 week high. Um, that target price there, I take those with a grain of salt. Same thing with these, uh, um, the analysts looks looking at them. They're very one year thinking they'll do them every year. Um, I think AT&T just got in trouble because they were paying their analysts to, to show that they were going to be lower so they could beat expectations. Um, looks like the quick ratio is probably negative there. Uh, we could probably confirm that by looking at their balance sheet. Uh, let me pull up uh, another thing here. Um, but the nice thing about the FinBiz, so we can scroll down and see exactly actually what the company does. That's probably something important to look at here. So uh, manufactures and sells poly, silicone, and photovoltaic 
in China. Okay, it offers ready to use polysilicon devices with physical stacking. So that sounds that's that's pretty uh not too sure what that is. But yeah, I want to address something real quick because people are talking about GameStop in the comments. Uh huh. Robert here pitched me GameStop last summer when it was at four dollars, saying it was undervalued. Uh, he's not it. saying yeah. go out and he's not no. saying go out and buy it now. No, 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 no. Yeah. Again, so like if you look at a uh, Simpay right here, four thirty, GameStop is top fifty dollars with good news. That's exactly right. So um, I I bought in I bought in at three, thinking that uh, at, in current state uh, the company was probably reasonable trade would be about seventeen dollars. So that would be about it was its book value was eleven dollars when I got in. Um, and so my thinking was, you know, people are underestimating tech or overestimating tech, underestimating their underlying business. Um, people were saying because of the short interest, that was a whole nother aspect that you had to take um, into account. So, um, yeah, I, I right now it is again. Yeah, it is. It is gambling, not trading, as uh, Gherkin said there. Um, but, yeah, I remember I, I was texting Robert throughout. Uh, like GameStop's crazy rise because like I, he was the one that first put it on my radar at four dollars and I was like oh it's at 50 now like you still got your shares and he's like finally eventually he got out at a certain I mean still like thousand percent gain for him but uh, yeah. I mean even if you look at uh, like Michael Burry I mean he, you saw him he he got out pretty early oh he got out before uh, even uh, the uh, before even the short squeeze which happened is, which is so interesting he, but he probably um, I mean no one could have foreseen the short squeeze coming kinda, but he's probably well, Kind of the main point with that GameStop uh, point, what we were saying is when I saw Michael Burry had bought it, I didn't just, you know, buy GameStop because he had it. I was like, well, what's the value? And you really need to understand because, I mean, he had bought it when it was like, I think what I was looking at that point is like seven bucks and then went to five bucks. And I mean, it was just getting beaten down. But because I knew or, and understood the underlying value in it, I understood that it going down was actually a fantastic opportunity and I scooped up more. Um, and that really goes down to the, like I said earlier, the margin of safety, me understanding I was buying $11 at that point, basically looking at book value. I was buying $11 for $3. I knew that with the short interest, um, that they were basically priced for bankruptcy, but bankruptcy wasn't really around the corner, especially with new consoles coming out. So in terms, in, in my aspect, my margin of safety on that trade seemed pretty, pretty high. So that's why I continued to throw more in. Um, Again, the the nice thing about the, the 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 fundamental analysis is you can use these ratios, but it really comes down to actually understanding the underlying company and, and deciding for yourself if if the odds of it going up are better than the price it's at right now. So, again, this DQ like we were looking at eighty eight oh seven. Uh, the product it has here, I'd have to do some interest on, and I, I really don't think everyone wants to see me just Google this. But that's yeah, we we, we would need would to do some more DD on this because neither Robert or I are very familiar. But I do. My next step would be to click on yeah to Google what exactly what this is and see. Um, its sales would be next, and unfortunately. So can you um, are you able to pull up your spreadsheet real quick in a different window? Yeah, we can absolutely. pull this off first, and then. Um, and then someone's asking about semiconductor stocks, so maybe we can take one like uh, AMD. Yeah, I know. Uh, so you have, you have a you have a good story about AMD too, and maybe we can look at the financials of that company. <laughs> yeah, I bought AMD was actually the first stock I ever bought. The second, I turned eighteen, and I bought it two dollars and twenty two cents a share, um, and then I had to sell it uh, first year of college for textbooks. So. Um, you bought AMD at two dollars twenty two cents, and yeah, it's at it hurt, it what ninety at, ninety yeah. bucks now. Yeah. Or? the 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 underlying the, the semiconductor industry is very interesting right now because I mean, I, from what I can tell, these things are just getting scooped up out the wazoo because of all the different uh, cryptocurrencies are out. I think they use the graphics cards mainly to 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 actually do the mining just because they have better processors in them. So um, both AMD and, and Nvidia, I know those are getting scooped up um, pretty big there. Let's see here, but um, let me see AMD here. And so, yeah, I mean, AMD, 52-week high is going to be 99. This is 82. And so, I mean, that's not – that's what 17% off. So, I mean, there's still room to go there. Um, I like to look at insider ownership too. A lot of times with these bigger companies, you're going to see insiders sell. Um, 
And that's not too concerning because a lot of them just systematically do that just because the amount of shares that are outstanding. Um, I mean, they're all people too, just trying to make some money. So um, fantastic uh, right here, barely leveraged. So that's that's good. Uh, quick ratio, two times more assets than, um, than liabilities there. Same thing for the current ratio. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is a sound business. I'd say especially with – um, everything going on, I think AMD probably has, I mean, at least a sound enough. Um, oh, I'm sorry, not Activision. I was going to look up NVIDIA. So, like, obviously it's contextual. So, um, you know, NVIDIA's got a, a really solid balance sheet as well. So, if I was looking at both of these co companies, um, AMD would look a little bit more enticing just because that 527 is pretty high. Um not necessarily saying it's too high for the company, but um, in relation to the AMD. So I'd want to look at market share next. Um, you can do that. Uh, what I was going to say next is if you actually click on this link here and you go to the company's websites, you can go down to uh, the investors. I usually do this when I'm looking at something. Oh, see, so you might need to reshare that window. Uh, I've only got oh, that window. Oops. Oh, okay, whoops, yeah. Let me see if I can pull up the uh, investors tab here. And then, so yeah, I pull up the investing um, part of the website, and then I usually go to the investor presentations because they usually go pretty quickly. I was going to say this on the Walmart is they, they, they pretty quickly try to summarize um, stuff like that, like market share, or they'll do. So part of your DD is go into the actual companies investor Absolutely. relations so, go into their presentations so again it, it's tough because this is all contextual so uh a, like example like i have to leave can you know, said amd is forcing with shortage of chips so i mean that's something that it, it's i would not just look at those ratios and decide to buy a company i would see that you know amd has a cheaper nvidia had a, a, a more solid balance sheet so these are things that i take into consideration so again my next uh thing I would do is I'd look at the news. I would also look at um, market share. Um, and in no way am I saying that either of these, I'm just trying to give you guys some examples of how my DD goes down or, or what I exactly look at or what my process is. Um, I, I'm not, I haven't been looking at either of these companies and I, I'm, I don't have any, I probably won't invest in either of these companies. But for you guys, I wanted to see exactly, what did you guys just see what I would do if, for example, someone recommended uh, the... Um, What's the word? The uh, the chips. They wanted to see the, the semiconductor chips, so that's what we were looking at as the two companies. So right, yeah, I would go to the Nvidia, and I would. And someone's to, asking about that they're faced with a shortage of chips, and the way I see that is there's kind of two sides of it. I mean, the, the bearish side is there's a you know supply problem. The bullish side is with the semiconductor shortage. Both AMD and Nvidia are basically guaranteed to sell every single chip that they produce, and right. Especially um, right now. I mean, that's, like I said earlier, that's probably just a sign of the times with all the uh, cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin mining, et cetera, that's going on is, I mean, if AMD's got a high demand, that's definitely good for their business. Yeah. Um, Someone's asking when will some company come off the OTC. And the, so so the to be listed on the NASDAQ, there are certain requirements that a stock, a company has to meet before they can be uplisted to to a certain um, to one of the stock exchanges. So exactly. as soon as and that happens, that that company will be uplisted if it happens. Right. And and my issue with the, the, the penny stocks is a lot of people like them because they um, obviously, you know, if you buy it at 10 cents and it goes to 20 cents, you made your money. And that's not that big of a move. But again, to actually look at the underlying business, it's pretty difficult to do because they don't have to disclose that much. Um, and my issue is like my brother, for example, he would do a bunch of uh, penny stocks. And then I'd, I'd just ask him straight up. I was like, what does that company do? And he's like, I, I have no idea, honestly. Or he's like, oh, they do blah, blah, blah. But it's th the whole point of the value investing is if you want to know what you're getting into, you want to understand the company. Um, it's hard to just do quick pulling these companies out and seeing and saying if it's a good buy or not. I mean, it's completely you like you, like I said earlier, you got to talk about that margin of safety. Um, take all the things into account. Um, I so guess, I, 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 or sorry, I know yeah. some, um, you know, like value investors kind of have a, a way, like they lay things out on a spreadsheet. Do you, so, do you do anything like that? Uh, yeah. So I have, um, there's something I was playing around with, which is like a, a Graham valuation model, which is when he basically took, uh, 
me see if I can share this. So this would be things that popped up on, you know, either I saw people talking about them on, uh, I saw people talking about them on uh, online, or I may have seen them talking about them on. Talking about, you're talking about the Graham models? Oh, uh, no, just these stocks. So oh, okay. Uh, basically what I did is I took, you know, it's, it's earnings per share. Can you zoom in on just one of those? Yeah, here. So let's look at um, this is a, wait. This what is mo? Because I've seen I've seen that. Yeah, some more mo is too. mo is is Altria Group. So um, I do. Oh like yeah, them. so Philip Morris. A, you got it. So there, I think that they're they were trading undervalued. I haven't looked at them. I think they had just had their earnings come out. So I haven't looked at them since those earnings came out. Um, but again, I think it's one of those uh, value stocks that I think they got plummeted during COVID. Um, this is again. So this is just a thesis I have. Uh, I think they got plummeted during COVID because smoking. I don't. I don't think smokers are going anywhere. Um, I was reading their financials, um, and they actually have a pretty interesting uh, way to get into the weed market pretty quickly with the Kronos Group. Um, Do you have a way to just kind of like zoom in on that one? Yeah, absolutely. So I think if you just Apple like plus or Command hit the oh, plus yeah. button, it'll zoom in a little bit. Oh, hopefully. Oh, oh yeah, there we go. There it is. Got it. So, oh my gosh. Um, and then kind of just like walk us through. So obviously EPS is earnings per share. Right. And then what are you and looking at in each of those this, numbers? Yep. So, so he says, uh, Benjamin Graham was pretty strict on what he invested in and obviously times changed. So he said, don't buy into anything that is, um, I think it was 11 times earnings. Um, and then it was, uh, I think it's something like 15 times book value. Um, so I had, I had read this thing that said that if you take the square root of 22 and a half times earnings per share and book value per share, um, you could see basically what his floor price would be. Um, so that's kind of what I did here is I just wanted to see, you know, is it undervalued by his standards? So um, for, for, for MO, for Altria, that 1584, that's what you would say the fair price well, of the that's stock. that's what. Benjamin Graham would say the fair the the the, the floor his model would say Graham. the fair value but, of the exactly but again the, the issue is is from where when he, when he was investing I mean he was investing like right after the Great Depression up until like the eighties or something like that so I mean he he was a long time ago uh, times change there's new way to do finances we have technology stuff that's popping off we have a growth aspect market you got to take the market the way it moves into account as well and this is what you were saying about everything being like contextual like you're not exactly. going to take one model and just start trading right. off of it so I would just see like you know it's something like this where it says you know 30 percent this would be potential return for him if he was going off of it so for me this NL I was like all right well let's look into it further but uh, again whenever I'm looking at these companies they look like they're undervalued but when you really get into them you see that their the underlying business is actually um, not that solid and so you you do have to go through a lot of crap honestly before you find something that's good yeah um, and i and i see like people asking about questions about um the dd and how we and so basically like i want to make a point clear that any screener or anything that we're running are just like ways to find trade ideas and then from there exactly. um is what exactly. when robert's talking about doing that uh, extensive DD where he'll, he'll even go into the company's earnings reports and see kind of the numbers they're reporting, what guidance they're saying. And so ev everything has to be done on kind of a case by case, stock by stock, company by company basis. So again, yeah, like I said, I, I'd run a screener um, and I would just see, you know, companies that are pretty low leverage. Um, I do do PE as well because um, I think a lot of people do buy in when they see low PE. Um, and then if I find a company that looks interesting, I usually will go look at the trend of the revenue. So I'll see how much money comes in. I don't like to see big dips. Um, if I do see big dips, that's when I go into their actual financial reports that they file with the SEC. So you just go to the SEC.gov and actually file or go to their, uh, their filings and actually just pull that report up. And I'll just go and look at where the income dropped in that year. So um, try to understand exactly why that dipped. A lot of times it's because they sell off an underlying business and, and then that becomes a little concerning because, yeah, they might have added more cash, but they're not getting that much revenue. So if they're just sitting on cash, but they're not doing anything with it, I don't really like that. Um, but um, again, yeah, so I like looking at uh, right now I'm looking at a bunch of big companies that I like that I think that uh, may have been neglected by the market, like I said earlier. 
Um, so, uh, well, yeah, six, I mean, the, the Russell 2000, which tracks, um, the small, small cap, cap stabs right. was, was just red hot and grew like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't even know hundred percent over a few months or, or right. six months with all the retail trade in. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so it would kind of make logical sense if you saw some of, some of that money flow out of the Russell and back into, um, right. you know, those like bigger blue chip stocks. And so, uh, so we can, we can do, um, uh, kind of two here i've seen these comments so someone wants to see an example with a finviz screener preset and then this guy is saying uh, he only has 10 bucks to invest so i that's actually a, a great thing that we can do is i can show you kind of how i would set that up um uh, because you know my income's not you know massive so the money that i actually put into the market yeah i'm not throwing ten thousand dollars in there so um i started with about 350 and i'm at i think i'm at 1200 now um you know a lot of that came from from GameStop, but um, again, it just comes down to me. I, I try to buy stuff that's undervalued. Um, let me see if I can share this so I can do this. This is a good. So, if I was gonna trade for ten bucks, yeah, I'd go for stock screener. Okay, perfect. So the main thing you're gonna want to do is go to this price, and you can actually hit under ten bucks. Um, and then next is I would honestly look for something with positive earnings. So you can see this is where you'd want to do the positive PE profitable. Um, just because with that ten bucks, you're gonna be there's gonna be a, just a lot of a lot of a lot of crap, honestly. So um, I'd say with that ten, you want to make sure that you're buying something that's actually making money. That's gonna be the most important thing to actually see that ten bucks grow. Well, and um, now too, I mean. You know, it's in 2021, we have the, you know, the opportunity to buy fractional shares via, mm-hmm. you know, whether you use Robinhood, Webull, even on Cash App. So if you wanted to buy $10 of Apple, you could. Um, I do like, you know, finding a stock, you know, buying a full share of a stock. Um, my other suggestion would be to, oh, someone's saying buy, buy a SPAC. Um, SPACs are a, interesting. So <laughs> another, uh, you know, interesting. I think kind of way to do that. Like if you only have $10, what I would do, I mean, if, if you have $10 now and you could have $10 a month from now, again, I would just set up like a recurring $10 a month into either a company that you really like, or just a, you know, spy ETF, something like that. And that way you'll get exposure and start investing. And you don't, it doesn't have, you don't have to have thousands of dollars to start investing. You can start building, whether it be just for cash on the side or. Right. I um, mean, honestly, the, 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 what I would say to people, which they think is boring, but I mean, if, if you have a hundred bucks, I mean, the best thing for you to do is just throw it in a mutual fund or ETF, because I mean, that's going to be something that, you know, might just track the market. That's the safest bet for you. If your main concern is actually just growing your money. But, um, I mean, there are people like me that like, they like the investing as a, as a hobby. Um, I mean, that's what, that's and what I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you there as well too. I mean, yeah, I enjoy picking it. And I, I think it's exciting just to see how everything's connected and how everything gets affected. So, um, I think the people that like that as a hobby, I mean, this is why it's a good resource to, to look into this and have this, the, the, the value aspect as a tool set. Um, yeah. And I see people in the comments asking about swings and stuff. And again, this, these are more like we're looking at companies from a value standpoint. So more long-term, um, investments. Right. So yeah, the, if you, if you're looking at those momentum trading, um, that's going to be more technical stuff that you're looking at there. But I, I mean, the issue you have with that is getting in too late. So what we do is we try to, pre- the way I invest is I try to prevent that by making sure that I'm buying at a discount to how it's trading. So the company itself is undervalued and I'm getting in at a discount to that. So um, anyway, so I'll continue with this. Is, so I do profitable here. I like to, obviously, like I said earlier, I like to make sure that they're actually making money on their margins. Um, usually what happens is I look down here and I see I got seven pages. That's a little aggressive. So, um, operating margin positive. I just keep plugging these in until I get that page down. We go down the current ratio. Um, so this is, again, this is going to be, um, the current assets minus current liabilities right there. Pay short-term obligations. So, um, I want that to be under, oh, sorry, over, probably over 0.5. I mean that knocked out a pretty good thing. I'll do the same thing on the uh, on the quick ratio there. So still about the same. So this in terms of leveraged, 
I'll probably try to say it's under 0.6. So again, this is going to be long-term debt to equity. There we go. Proportion of equity and debt the company is using to finance its assets. So again, for every dollar of equity, 60% is going to be funded by debt. Do the same thing with this. And so we're getting a little bit better there. So then I would then go look at these discounts to, to price to books. So then I would click on this. And I would see right here, these are all trading at a discount to book value. So we have oil and gas. So we know oil has been kind of hot recently. I, these commodity ones, I, I'll i buy some commodities. But um, again, since a lot of them are, are going to be moving with the actual underlying commodity itself. So there's a gold one there. If gold's having a bad day, this is going to have a bad day. Gold will have a bad day because the market's up or because yields are going up. There's a lot of stuff that you have to look into. Um, another thing you want to make sure you're watching too is this volume. So this is going to be actually the amount of trades or amount of shares that are traded each day. If you have these pretty low, um, an example here would be this JRSH. I actually like this company a lot. They have a really strong balance sheet. Uh, they make like the clothes for like American Eagle and a bunch of big brands. But I mean, if you look at the underlying volume there, I mean, it's 10,000. This thing didn't move at all, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But obviously, if you're trying to make money, volatility is going to be your best friend. Um, especially. Um, um, so I, what I want to do real quick is I, I pitched this stock earlier on a uh, on on a show on our power hour show that we do in the, in the afternoon and it wasn't really fair because i pitched it and it was already up like eight percent today but i gave you a shout out i said it was from you um and it, it was cxw core civic and i know you came to me with this one i don't know about a month ago yes. I, I know it was in one of michael burry's uh most recent filings but what i want to do is just if you can pull up the the ratios on that see what Absolutely. you liked in it and so um, this one i i like this um for a number of reasons. So basically what happened is it popped up on one of my screeners one day. Uh, I was looking at it. I was like, well, this is interesting. You know, it's, it's honestly, they do, they do private prisons. So I knew that there was a little bit of a, there's going to be some heat from the market on that. I knew with Biden coming in, there was going to be a, uh, an aspect from the, um, you know, obviously the Democrats are trying to end the private prison use. Um, so I wasn't really sure if it was, if it was a good pick, but you know, after I, I looked into, I think I read a seeking alpha article about someone was running through the numbers where, um, you know, if everything bad actually did happen, the underlying business in terms of, uh, contracts, their contracts are, they go on, um, they have like five or six year contracts still signed. So, I mean, even if Biden comes in and and says, you know, hey, we're not doing your contracts anymore, um, which he did do. Um, he signed that executive order where it said they're not going to extend the contracts. Um, the market went, the stock went down, but again, the actual contracts were. They're still active. They're still active, now. and they're still active. I think the the one that they said, like the Department of Justice, is the one that they can't extend on. So this CXW itself is actually not. Um, they they aren't that weighted towards. The Department of Justice. I think they have a, the BOP, which is the Bureau of Prisons. I think they have like one contract with them that they just signed an extension with. Um, but uh, again, after I looked into it, I was like, all right, you know, I'll, I'll throw some money at it. And then Michael Burry, like you said, he updated his things and he threw a million dollars at it. So I was like, oh, well, obviously my thesis is correct. So I kind of kept digging. But um, the big point for me here, too, is the uh, book value per share. If you see that's trading at $11.62. Yeah, can you zoom um, in on that a little bit? Yeah, maybe? absolutely. So. Right here, book value per share, $11.62. And it's Currently only trading, trading at 9 nine oh nine today. So I think I jumped in at about $7. Bucks. Um, but And so real quick, a couple things. with And, and so what was um, – well, hold on. I, saw, I see Leia in the, in the comments saying private prisons are horrible. I said this earlier. I don't like what they do for a business. We're looking at the value that the companies hold right. and just determining that based on the current stock price, the company's undervalued. So We're, it's important. Yeah, it's important to know that when you're buying these shares, the, the company's not really making any money off of you buying these shares. They've already sold these shares to someone else. You're buying these on the secondary market. Yeah, um, this is for us to make money. We're not buying, also, we're not putting money into the into the. I do um, agree. Yeah, the, it is it is a bad business. But like I said earlier, if everyone hates it, you might be looking at some value. So. Um, and then what what did the company itself? CXW say in its most recent uh, kind of earnings and so, guidance about the and can you kind of and, and like can you show us where you would go to find that and pull yeah, it up? Yeah, absolutely. So I would just go to the let me just run a tutorial here. 
this is again you're going to look at their earnings or not their earnings sorry their uh, earnings report um, but also there was a I'll pull this up here actually I need to get stuff in the tabs but um, so they did a news wire this is the this is the kind of the same point but um, da -da, share screen yeah, I mean, it, it it would be a little easier to find this in Benzinga Pro than Finviz, yeah. but you know, we'll. <laughs> I gotta play around with that Benzinga Pro. Looks looks the, yeah, it's got a lot of tools on there. Looks looks dope. So, um, so for example, this is a thing. So this U.S. Marshal Services. These are the other guys uh, besides the the, the um, Bureau of Prisons that the Department of Justice uses for their private prisons. Now, the U.S. Marshal Service does own their own prisons. Um, the Bureau of Prisons has to contract out, but they're doing the GEO. That's another private prison company. Uh, they have a pretty big short interest, and I think that might be because of their exposure to the Department of Justice. It just, I, I found out today that it was a uh, shout out Luke Jacoby. It was an out, or GEO didn't get a contract this morning. But I was more really? curious if you went to, like straight to the CXW website and then went to their like earnings or whatever. I know no, the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I always go to the SEC website. So I know we're bouncing around here, so I'll go back to what I was doing. Yeah, there. yeah. Um, I just find that these are easier to use, but I go here and you just click on this company filings, and then you can click on. Uh, and then uh, Labelle in the comments is saying, "I usually only invest in stocks that I actually use or plan on using in the future. Private prisons are therefore a no go for me." And again, I just want to reiterate the fact. I, I, I'm holding a position in CXW. Actually, I think I sold some today, but I'm not investing in private prisons with the intention of, oh, I think private prisons are going to keep growing and I want them to be around. No, it's just, it's mm -hmm. undervalued. And right. we, we're expecting the stock so, to to go up because it's undervalued. And then once it goes up, I'll sell it. So yeah, my, my whole thinking is, is I think right now the market is valuing this company in terms of like people are saying, you know, private prisons are bad. Um, I agree. I, I, but I don't think that we are the United States is in a position to get rid of them as much as people think that the, we will. And obviously, a big platform that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were pushing when they were running for president is to end that. Um, but I don't think it's possible yet. And the fact is, is this company is is priced like it's going to happen. Um, and I don't think it's going to happen in nearly the time frame that people expect it to. Right. Um, so because ba basically they said no new contracts, but for the time being, which is for the next right. five, you know, however many plus years, those contracts are ongoing and active. Right. And so um, and the other thing, too, is is uh, when people say that uh, that GEO company, I mean, they from what I've I've seen is apparently they do a lot of uh, um, uh, money towards politics to keep the private prisons in place. Um, and core civics, they're very big on, uh, reintroducing. They want to make sure that, you know, when people get out, they get out there, they throw a bunch of money of, uh, you know, making sure that, uh, inmates can get jobs when they get out. Um, and I think that there's a bunch of value in that as well. Um, in terms of like, like you said, you know, people investing in it, people are anti that, but I mean, you do want to support a company that, that, that'll, that'll help those inmates or those, are, that's a company that's going to help that just helps get their name out there. If you're an investor. Um, you know, saying that this company, you know, they're doing that. And I think that's kind of what they're new. They're trying to shift to um, is they're going to shift to start doing that and, and getting, ha you know, homes for inmates to go and help them get new jobs. But um, anyway, yeah, yeah, back to the back to the point about the, the SEC website. And then, yeah, I just pulled up oh, this yeah. 10K right here. So after you look up the ticker, um, you can click on this. So the 10Ks are going to be the annual reports. Um, and then they have the 10 Qs, which are the quarterlies. So uh, I use most recent most recent filing. Um, you can get right here where you can actually go by the sections. But I'm old school, and I actually was using this before they had that. So I just go straight up HTML. Okay. It's just like a basic. Like <laughs> We're getting super techy here. Exactly. Now. Well, yeah. So you could. This is basically just lets you search to where you want to go. But I don't like how it has the underlines because I was. I've just trained myself basically and been used to doing this but uh basically like i was saying if you go down to um if you just find like the income stuff so here's like you know financial discussion this is a management discussion analysis of financial condition and results of operations so in layman's terms this basically means if you go down and you find where their income is right 
they basically give you a commentary of everything that that happened so they say this is what the income was you know we had if they had a decrease in revenue based off last year they explain why they explain what that difference was um, they usually have forward-looking statements where they say what they want to do going forward um, I mean this is a this is about as close as talking to a CEO as you can get is reading these financial reports um, now you can find you can find sources where people will actually um, read these things and then oh, kind of yeah, like put them out and yeah, I don't think I was sharing the actual report itself but oh shoot yeah that was probably my fault it popped up there um but yeah the uh and that's part of what we were saying about you know all this being like a case-by-case basis like well oh here we go here's the actual report results operations are impacted by number of credits 42 we own so these are this is all like deep in the weed stuff that you know robert likes to do for companies that he's interested in investing in and this is part of the dd process you run the screeners you find things that match the ratios but that's not the final step. You know, he wants to go in and make sure that the financials look good, the core business model looks good. And, um, right. well, I guess in this case for private prisons, maybe not the core business model, but the fact that it's right. getting undervalued by well, the rest yeah, of the market. Exactly. And so, again, that's, um, we're not selling you to buy this. We're just saying, you know, this is just an example of something that I would feel was undervalued. And like people said, I mean, it's not necessarily a good business, but I think that people are overestimating how long they're going to be around. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a sad fact, but uh, again, I mean, it, it's, it's stock trading. The stock doesn't really care about us. Um, yeah, exactly. Really care about the stock, but it's not something that I'm going to be an advocate for. You know, if someone came in and said, we're ending private prisons today, I think that there, there's a lot of problems that would come with that, but, um, underline, yeah. but, uh, I don't think it's going to happen, but I wouldn't be against it, but, so we do have to wrap here, but I want to, uh, I just want to do a quick recap kind of what we've talked about as far as like your strategy, the DD, what ratios, um, you know, you look at which ones you don't necessarily look at and, and just a quick couple minutes, we'll do a quick recap. Yeah. So, uh, main thing is, like I said, yeah, I usually start with the screener. Um, a lot of my stuff too, it's like reading the news, um, see a company, looking at the company, see a competitor that's a little undervalued. Um, but yeah, I'd start with the screener. Usually, look up, look at the ratios, which are going to be the current ratio, which is going to be balance the balance sheet health within the next year. Um, that's big because obviously, if you're looking at something that's underperforming, um, your main concern concern should be bankruptcy. Um, once you can write that off, then you want to see if maybe revenue is decreasing for any significant reason. A lot of the times, especially with the growth aspect, um, a lot of people aren't liking that revenue stays the same which I think is, again, that's a value play. If you can keep consistent revenue, that's, a, that's I think, more important than seeing growth go up because that just means that you're able to manage your finances better. I mean, it's just like being a normal person. You know, if you're getting the same paycheck every day, you know what bills you need to pay first, et cetera. So. Someone just asked in the comments if you, if you recommend Benjamin Graham's book to read about all this. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, again, like I said, The Intelligent Investor, that one's really good. It's It's very, very technical. Um, there's a lot of great YouTube videos where people summarize the, the underlying, um, information in it pretty well. Yeah. The intelligent investor, very, very good book. Um, there is, um, another book, which is common stocks, uncommon profits. Uh, that's another really good one where, um, it's, a uh, Philip Fisher. Uh, I think he was a student of Benjamin Graham's. Um, and then, uh, there's another one. It's like the, uh, Buffettology, which is what he looks at in a, in spreadsheets. Um, awesome. I mean, the, the best thing I'd say is, yeah, just I'd read those, uh, YouTube videos. Again, there's people that make videos on them, read that. The main point being just understand what you're getting into. Don't just buy something because someone's saying it. Like it's probably hard to say with us going through all these, uh, stocks yeah. and saying what we like about them. But, uh, the main point is understand the underlying business or understand exactly why it's value the way it is for dummy books those are great as well fundamental analysis for dummies a fantastic book um there's courses you can get online as well um but you know i think uh yeah we don't need the courses we have enough in free information on uh, and good information yeah. here on benzinga um all right last chance we you got one more chance to to any tickers any stocks that you think are, are undervalued uh yeah so i've been looking at xerox i think xerox is 
is pushed down right now. I think they're making they've been making a shift away from actual printers, but a lot of their actual cash flow is coming in from contracts that they've signed with big um, companies. Um, they have a big uh, again those companies. They have a, a a good connection with them. Um, they made a shift too to technology where they're doing like a like an online document cloud for businesses and enterprises. They can basically oh um, like to compete with DocuSign or not really DocuSign. It's more like a, you know if you're working on a project, you upload it to this cloud and it's accessible for everybody all over the. Um, like if they're working at home, that's the uh -huh. main thing that they're trying to do. And then they're also doing 3D printers as well. So. So this is, yeah, this is where Robert, if he hears Xerox, this is where he would go into the company, start looking at the earnings reports, doing his due diligence, and uh, find out if he, if he thinks the stock is truly undervalued right now. Absolutely, yeah. All right, well, uh, thank you. Go thank you again for, for joining us, Robert. Yeah, we, have, no we, have a, we, have a, we have a show coming up with Flex Trades. We're, we're, we're switching from fundamentals to, uh, techni so to technical trading right here. There we go. Are you going to stick around for that, Robert? You know, I might give it a look. I, uh, technical stuff's good, too. You can kind of incorporate both of them. I think that's if you're smart, you go through all yeah. of them. All right. Um, well, thank you again. We'll see you see you next week for some more fundamentals. Absolutely. Take care. All right, y'all. How we doing? Doing Mr. good, man. Mr. Hot Stocks, how we doing? Boom. I'm back. I'm, I'm back. back. I've got a special guest who, who's about to be joining us. Um, and, and what's up, everybody? So, so that was more like the fundamental long-term approach. Now we're going to be getting a little bit more into to trader psychology, uh, you know, how, how we're trading these st stocks we like right now. I've got a couple stocks that I'm in that I want to get out of, so, so I'll talk through those, uh, talk through a little bit of options trading that I did today, um, and, and more or less just, just how we're setting up for the week. So, so let me throw my, my main man onto the screen here. Well, wait, you know what we have to do before that, right? What, what do we have to do? We have a little a video we have to play. Oh, I didn't know if we had one or not. All right, rip it. Oh, well, we just have our special. <laughs> Flex Trade. What's what up, up, Matt? What's going on, man? How you doing? Doing well. How about yourself? Good to be on without any technical issues this time. Hop there right we in, go. go straight into it. I know it makes it easy, right? If we can it's both easy. hear each other, the audience can hear us. You know, it, it makes life easier. And what's up, everybody in the chat, all you out there in Zinger Nation? Again, we're we're about to be talking some trading. Let's do it, man. You you have a good day. You have a good start to the week. I did. So so. I heard I mean, Robert, the last guy that was on was was um the 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 big fundamental guy. So we gotta we gotta talk some technicals here and get them. Get them on board with the with the technical side of things. Exactly right, and I mean they play hand in hand, right? You use your fundamentals to find the stocks, and then we're gonna use our technicals for entries, exits, stops, etc. You can use both. That's the beauty of the market. There's no there's no one way to make money in the market, and I think that's the beautiful part of it. Yep, a uh, hundred and ten percent agreed with you. So so. Uh, where, where are you at with, with, with this market or, or this week in general? All right, we, 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 we're at all time highs right now. Uh, how do you feel? Uh, I'll, I'll get a chart up on the screen here in a second, but, but I'm, I'm curious where you're at with things. Yeah, I mean, good, good question. I think a lot of people are trying to, are asking themselves the same thing, maybe looking to, to get opinions of others. So it's interesting because I want to say three weeks ago, Three weeks ago, I have to check my calendar or maybe look at a chart. Yeah, about three weeks ago, mid mid February, um, just kind of started to notice a little bit of chopping. And if you go to the daily time frame on the S and P or the Spy, yep. So 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 here's a one year chart. Each candle on this chart here is one day. Yeah. So that's kind of the the primary. Um, that's kind of the go to look for technical traders. You want to pull up your daily time frame candlesticks your classic candlesticks green candlesticks red candlesticks um for those for those who aren't technical savvy uh like like luke and myself <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah no a couple weeks back it was just we were at this point which was kind of an awkward point in the market because there was a lot of there was a lot of small cap mid cap and i say small cap mid cap and it's kind of funny because those small cap mid caps turned to like large caps over the course of the last year but 
a lot of the, uh, I call them the bubble sector. So like the electric vehicle stocks, the green energy stocks, hydrogen fuel cells, stuff like that. So last year, oh, in the start of this year, we also had the marijuana stocks. Again, small caps, a lot of, lot of money flow, a lot of momentum into these stocks. And then you had something also like the broad market, which was getting up to the point of a bit of expansion from like the 50 day moving average. That's kind of the, the go to metric that I use for the broad market. When we're 5% or 7% or 10% extended from the 50 day, that's when I start pressing the brakes and, and telling myself, okay, we need to pull back a little bit. We might get, we might get a little bit of a cool off period soon. But anyway, back to my, my overall thesis several weeks back, just all the, all the small cap, mid cap, the bubble sector, everything just so, so, so overextended thousands of percents, um, thousands of percent from their lows from this time last year. It's not sustainable. So at the same time, I'm a trader. I'm in, I'm in the market to make play, make place trades and make money. And, you know, I love when the market's super lucrative and I love having my foot on the gas. But at the same time, when I start seeing, you know, videos of, of random pe people, um, TikTok influencers online starting to sell their product, that's when I tell myself, okay, maybe we're starting to get to a market peak here and I'm going to slow my roll. I'm going to, instead of foot on the gas, I'm going to kind of pump the brakes a little bit. I actually took off uh, last week kind of fully, um, not last week, the week before I was off completely. I didn't, I didn't trade, uh, last week I placed maybe five trades and it was a little bit later in the week. Um, but yeah, I just, I cooled off and, and you were talking market psychology and it's a big part of my trading. I, I, I firmly believe that the psychological aspect of trading is far and, uh, above and beyond the most important component to successful trading. Um, if you keep your, your mental state of mind clear, um, if you don't burn yourself out, if you don't burn your, your, your actual capital in your account and you don't burn your mental capital, um, you stay sharp. And that's what I was doing the last few weeks. And then, uh, I think it was last week when it, you see on the SPY, we had that pullback from, um, well, that's QQQ. Q, 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 Q. Yeah, here, yeah, I, I pull up, I pull up NASDAQ be, be, because I, I I imagine that for a lot of us, it's more reflective of our portfolios. Yeah, right? with a lot of overweight tech too. positions. Yeah, because tech actually is not, and you see SPY closed at all time highs. QQQ yeah. is still about six percent or so, if my math is correct, from all time highs. So it's got a little bit of ground to cover. Um, and I was saying this last night on a webinar that there's kind of good and bad news with that. Um, the good news with, with broad tech being still kind of, um, I guess you could say it's lagging behind industrials and SPY. Um, the good news is that there's, there's still some ground to gain. So there's still potential for more upside on this leg to follow through. And now we have stuff like stimulus checks hitting people's bank, bank accounts. Um, I don't know. Are there any positive catalysts? Oh yeah. I mean, people are going back out. I mean, the economy's starting to rev up the engines a little bit. People are traveling now. People are people are starting to spend their money a little bit more. Um, it seems a little bit more relaxed, um, especially if you're comparing it to like this time last year. It's totally night and day difference, you know. So, I with that kind of fundamental approach. And again, I'm not a fundamental trader. I I sprinkle a little bit of fundamentals here and there. But if you're using that kind of fundamental approach. You think to yourself, okay, maybe there could be a little more follow through with a chart set up like this and, you know, things starting to get back toward normal, quote, normal, uh, you know, maybe there's a little bit of follow through, but. So, so, but so are you, are you net long right now or, or are you, are you sitting on the sidelines or, or where are you at? So I, so my game plan for this week, which was my game plan. So Thursday night, last week, going into Friday and then going into this week. My yep. game plan, my thesis has kind of been travel stocks, leisure stocks, like like stocks within the. Uh, so I'll give you some examples, um, like Royal Caribbean, um, RCL, um, United Airlines, UAL. Something last week like Boeing. I mean, Boeing. It's kind of broad with everything. Um, uh, something like a hotel. Maybe throw a hotel in there, Marriott or Hyatt. 
And if you look at those charts, they all kind of have that similar look. Um, they're, they're very similar. They're not, they're not exactly the same, but they're similar. Um, and the sense that they've had, a, they, they had that huge washout along with everything else in the market uh, this time last year. So like early spring when the market pulled back huge, you saw stocks like Boeing go from, I mean, what was Boeing? Boeing went from, yeah, let's get say, this one up on the screen here. Yeah. All right, so here's Boeing. So, so it looks like our pre-COVID high was 350, yeah, almost on the dot. 350 down to sub 100 in the course of a couple months. That was unheard. That was mind-boggling. The, yep. the the sharpness and the velocity behind that drop was mind-boggling. I'm sure there was tons of people out there that that thought to themselves, Boeing might go under. Boeing might not get out of this alive. Um, you know, for, for and especially days, with all the other issues that they were having, yeah, yeah, which they now seem like they've mostly gotten through, right? We're talking about the, the, the 737s yeah. not landing, basically. Yeah, there was a lot, it was a lot of fundamentals, yeah. and and I mean, the technicals were freaking broken, everything was just shattered. Um, and myself included, there was a couple of days with Boeing uh, early last spring where I thought to myself, like, oh my god, like this, this could hit 50 and just go up and smoke, like. Luckily, it recovered and it constructed itself. And you see, during the course of that 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 month, are these weekly time frames? Uh, so so let's oh, these see. are weekly. Yeah, these are weekly. So we're on a two-year chart. Here's a daily. Yeah. So if you go to late March, early April, that moved from 100 up to 180. There was that huge bounce follow-through, and then you had that multiple week period of digesting that move. And then it kind of constructed itself back up into that inflection. Then bang, had a follow through move. And then guess God, what? God, what a choppy stock. It did the same thing though. That's what's so beautiful about it. It had it had that big follow through in early June. And then it spent the course of the following, what? What is that? Five months digesting that move. Yep. And then you see something similar again from December up until a couple weeks ago or, or last week. It kind of had the same move. So Boeing was actually a, a big one for, for me last week. I kind of was, was eyeing it. Um, you see the can, the, the, not this candle, not the candle before. So about five candles back, it started getting tight. Yeah. Right Somewhere about around there. here you're talking about. Yeah. It started getting tight again, kind of on, on the other side of that consolidation, that multi-month consolidation. So I was, I was scaling in there and I, I hit a pretty decent trade, but going Absolutely. back just to the overall the overall thesis with the market, just the reopening stocks, stuff like, I mean, if you pull up a, if you pull up a stock like RCL, so that's Royal Caribbean. So it's a cruise. It's yep. A cruise let's stock. look at it. So, I mean, this time last year, the last thing in the world that anybody was doing was going on a cruise. I think actually, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't, didn't a cruise line somewhere in the world kind of like spark off the whole, or like, or when COVID kind of first started, wasn't there like a cruise line that got like a few hundred people on board and they were stuck for a couple of weeks and then everybody yes. was getting sick, right? I don't know. There was like a couple, like they couldn't yeah. land. That was the craziest news. Like I couldn't, yeah. it was like the cruise from hell. Your, your five day <laughs> cruise turns into two months. Sure they will. No sure country will that. take you. Yeah. I'm sure there's going to be some kind of movie or documentary, but yeah. So it's crazy because Royal Caribbean, another one, Royal Caribbean washed out sub 20 this time last year. That, that was crazy. You're talking about um, a, a pull down, let's see, percentage wise. Yeah, let's go back two years. So this is a two year chart. Each candle on this chart, guys, is it represents a week. So so, so our pre-COVID highs were, were in January, 135 to 20. Eighty-five percent. Yeah, exactly. Eighty-five percent drawdown in a couple months. Mind-boggling stuff. And again, you talk about companies where a lot of people, myself included, were thinking for a couple days. And I'm sure there's still people that are thinking it, but they're probably more delusional. But for a few days, I was thinking, wow, like something like this could go up. Uh, they could go under. Like they, they might not make it out of this alive. You know, you you, you pull back eighty-five yep. percent. This huge discount. Um, and at the time there's, I, I'm sure you've heard the saying, Luke, there's blood in the streets. Everybody's panicking. Everything's selling off huge. It's kind of like the psychology flips a bit. Everybody wants discounted stocks. Everybody wants a, a lower stock. If you're, if you're a long-term investor, 
But then when it happens, like we had last March or April, whenever, whenever the sharp, sharp pullback, I think it was mid March, right around this time last year, actually it might even be to the date that we bottomed out last year. I might, I'm going to double check that. But when that happens, it, it was the 23rd or right, the, 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 the lowest day last year was, was March 23rd. So we're, okay. A we're week close. off of it, too, we're, basically. We're a week away from, from the generational yep. bottom, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just crazy how that psychology flips. You're, you're, so, you're so inclined to buy the dip, buy the dip, and then all of a sudden you get a freaking waterfall, and you're, you're, you have a loss, and you're sitting on a loss, and you think, do I average down? Well, you know, what, how do I take it from there? Myself, I'm not an investor. I trade. I'm in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, but this time last year, I mean, geez Louise, like 85, 80% discounts on, on a lot of these travel stocks. And then you see over the course of the last year, they just kind of have multi-month at a time, stair-stepped their way back up. And so if you're asking something that I'm currently, that I've been watching and still, I still have skin in the game and I'm still paying close tabs on something like RCL. Um, and if you compare RCL, so cruise, and, 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 and can I can I ask you a couple couple questions? Yeah, go for it, bro. All right. So 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 you're you're trading this stock. You're you're technical. Mm -hmm. I'm imagining that that some of these highs are are key levels that you're looking at. It looks like we've oh, got yeah. highs around 97. And then it looks like we have the high of the move is right pretty much at 99 on the dot. Yeah, right right below 100. And and 100 is kind of that big psychological level, that big triple digit whole whole number. Uh, but yeah, I mean, how, how I kind of, so this is kind of my approach into a setup like this. So last week, mm -hmm. if you, if you see, if you're excluding today's candle, you had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven candles in that little channel there. Uh, you have a pretty distinct lower end of that channel, which, um, I, and, and, I, and if, if you have a screen to share, you can take over the screen share too. Oh, is that right? How do I? I'm not sure how to do that. I'll so, try to. So, so check it out. If you go onto the the streaming software, there's a button at the bottom that says share. That's the one you want. And while you're looking for that, so somebody somebody in the chat is clarifying for us that it was a a, a CCL. What is that? That's Carnival Cruise Carnival, Line cruise yeah. that got stuck. It was a two day cruise that ended up lasting weeks when when somebody on board got COVID. <laughs> Oh. So, so your two day cruise turns into a, a one month cruise from hell. <laughs> yeah. You got my screen, Luke. Is it up now? Uh, yeah. Let me throw it up here. All right. There we go. Cool. We have it. Let me, uh, let me blow this up a little yeah, bit. If you, if you can zoom, that would be awesome. Is that better? Should I zoom in a little bit more? Is that yeah. Good? If you can a little bit more. Yeah. Let's do, let's do that. Is that there better? we go. Yep. Cool. That's good. And I'll add a couple extra bars too. So this is something I do with with my clients. I, I I'll kind of like I'll kind of like sketch out like how I see it playing out. And again, nothing awesome. is financial advice, but I'm a visual learner. This is kind of how I learn. So I take so what I was saying anyway. The 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 last several days prior, excluding today's candlestick. If you go back the last prior seven days or so, you had a pretty distinct channel, right? We can all agree. You had you had about a week's worth of action within this well-defined channel, and then today we had a and and and, and tell us too. But as I see in the chat, and actually this would be helpful for us guys. Yeah. In, in the chat, drop in how much experience you have. Like, like like if you're brand new, tell us that you're new. If you're intermediate, tell us you're intermediate. If if you've been doing this for a while, let us know. But because that'll help uh, help us gear this towards you guys. And of course, smash the like button so we can keep keep this education going. Um, but, but Matt, so, so, so when you're I'll saying that keep you, it in as layman's terms as possible, cause I know there's all types of different, um, education levels and experience levels and, and some people aren't even technical traders. So I'll try to, I'll try to keep it, I'll try to keep it as simple as I can. Perfect. But, but, but when you're talking about this channel here, what, what, what causes you to identify that channel? Right. Like, so like, like, what are you looking for to say, okay, we have a clear channel here. Yeah. So essentially all a channel is, is it's a supply and demand channel at the upper end is where you find the supply on the lower end is where you find the demand and channels can span over the course of weeks or months or years. Sometimes it's, it's a week like this. And this is what I I'll refer to this as a micro channel. This is a micro channel. So you had a big washout here. So I'll just kind of draw that out. You had these couple days where you had a nice big washout. And then it recovered back 
and then stayed within this. So this lower trend line, just think of it as that's where demand came in, right? There were buyers there yep. one time, two time. And then when I go over this third time, it was even higher than that. And then even higher and then even higher. Okay. So that was the bottom end of the channel. That's where you had the demand. The top end of this micro channel is where you had your supply. That's where you had your sellers. That's where you had, you'll, you'll hear people refer to it as resistance. So we had the washout, it bounced back, resistance, supply, sold back off, another candle, more supply, another candle. So it was like a very well-defined micro channel of that supply and demand. And then today you see that we kind of, we gapped over it and then we closed well above it. So it's not like I'm here to say, it's safe to say that we are out of this supply and demand micro channel for good. But if you're looking at it from a technical perspective, we kind of broke that inflection today. And now we're kind of, what I'm looking for over the next several days is to develop a new micro channel up here in this range, perhaps. Maybe it takes a couple days, maybe it takes one or two, and then a follow through candle at the other end of it over that $100 mark, maybe up to, the way I look at it is if it gets through 100, because it's a big psychological number. Yep. A lot of these charts are the same way right now. Um, I have UAL, which is another one. And I, I'll, I'll refer back to that in a moment um, because there's a lot of comparisons that you could potentially draw into RCL's chart. Um, but that $100 psychological level um, typically when you break through a level like that, there's usually some good follow through. So the way I'm, the way I'm setting up this trade is right now, end of week. Um, I told you kind of generally how I trade these, um, last time we talked Luke on, on the show last yep. time, but I'm generally looking to go in the money. I'm trying to get as close to intrinsic value as I can. Um, sometimes if it means, um, instead of paying like 10 bucks a contract, if it means that I'm paying five bucks a contract, but I'm paying for a 20% premium, but I'm the, the contract I'm buying is a whole number. Um, so typically with the whole number, so like 90, 95. Yeah. All right, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm gonna slow you down for a second. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, 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 so the way that you're, you're playing this one or, 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 or individual stocks in general is, yeah. is, is you're typically using options rather than the common stock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I imagine that that's because it helps you to take advantage of some of that nice options leverage. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, exactly right? that. I mean, instead of instead of putting $2 million in stock, you could put thirty dollars or $40,000 in a stock and get the same kind of return um, if, if it goes in your favor. I mean- Exactly, and, and, and when you're saying, and then like, I, sorry, I just want to clarify one other no, point. You're good. Just, just, just to just slow. I'm always the guy who slows stuff down. Okay, slow it down. So, so, I talk so, fast. I'm I, I talk fast and I go through this. I breeze through it, bro. So I, I got I need I need the checks and balances to kind of uh, ask me uh, ask away that. Yeah. And, and guys, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. That that that's what we're we're doing this for you guys, not not for our own amusement. So if you have questions, drop them in there. But but when you're saying that you're you're playing in the money options, uh, what what that means, right? So so if we look at Royal Caribbean as an example, that that's the chart that we have up on the screen here. I'll make it nice and big. Um, you know, stocks at, at about 94 bucks. Uh, so, so instead of buying options that, that are, are cheaper, you know, maybe at a hundred dollars or $105, Matt, Matt's buying them at maybe $80 or $90. I mean, it means that the option is more expensive to, to, so, so it costs you more money to get into the trade. But you know, if, if things move against you, it's not like your investment is going to zero necessarily. Um, uh, you know, what, what are other advantages of that? Yeah. I mean, in the money, I think the biggest advantage for being closer to that intrinsic value is that you don't have to worry about all the Greeks. You don't have to worry about time decay and theta. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about your, your options contract losing money just from time alone. Right. right. If, you're intrinsic value, if you're buying an out of the money option, right? So if you buy a hundred and five strike option and let's say you have a month on it, that, you're that, losing that value every day that it's not going higher. And even if it does exactly. go higher, you might still be losing money if it's not going high enough fast enough, you know? Exactly. Right. So 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 if you have three weeks for a stock to get to 105 and it's just hanging out in the middle, 
the, the, the value of your contract is going to go down every single day because you have the time and the price component. Whereas if you're buying options that are below where the stock is trading at, that, that, that time component more or less goes away. Yep. Yep. And again, like you said from the start, it's just a, it's, so it's that component, but also the whole leverage idea. So with something like Royal Caribbean, you know, if, if you buy, let's say in order to make, I don't know, I'm trying to draw, let's do a comparison with nice round whole numbers. So a yep. thousand, a thousand shares at, at $95 a share. So it closed at 94 and, a, and 94 and a half, a thousand shares. So each dollar you make a grand on, you need to spend $95,000 to buy those thousand shares, right? Math yep. check out. So with an options contract, something the way that I play, for example, is with a, especially with a setup like this. Um, and again, there are other ways that I play, but for the most part, it's it's the the core position is going to be intrinsic, as close to intrinsic as I can. Um, so instead of paying ninety five thousand dollars, for example, I might be paying five thousand dollars for the same number of shares um, in equivalent in the options position. So the ninety dollar strike. I think I'm, I think I actually paid a bit of premium. So I think those actually closed around like five and a half. So there's about a 20% premium, like I was saying, but still the point holds true. Instead of paying $95,000, you're paying 5,000, 6,000, and you essentially have the same position. Yep. There's other, there's other components to it, but kind of just generally speaking, that's kind of the way you can look at it. Yep. Uh, and that's and, 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 the of options, really. And and and, and I'm, I'm going to let you get back to it in a minute. And I've got some more questions about this setup here. Um, yeah. But 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 I want to pull these two questions out of the chat. I'm looking at the first one is is how far out do you buy your options, right? What what what's the time horizon you're looking at it with, with a setup like this? And again, guys, if you're just joining us, I'll put it in the chat. The 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 chart that we're looking at is is Royal Caribbean ticker RCL Romeo Charlie Lima. Uh, so, so again, the first one is how far out, um, and then the second one is is getting into ju just how you identify your setups, and, and that's basically what you were in the middle of of talking to us about. Yeah. So, how far out? So, I think a lot of times people think um, you you. I think people get tripped out a lot of times by end of week contracts, and again, if you're going far out of the money. If you're significantly out of the money and your contract expires in four days, you're in a world of hurt. If if your stock doesn't move the direction you need you need it to move to quickly, you're in a you're going to be in a world of hurt. The beauty of the way that I'm playing and that I typically play with my options is that since I'm in since I'm getting to as close and intrinsic as I can, and again, like I was saying, I'm at about a twenty percent premium. So if if it was Friday right now, I would lose a dollar per contract, 20% premium, lose that. But the beauty of the end of the week, so to answer your question, I only go to the end of the week every time. I'd say nine times out of You're time. You're doing a, a pretty short time horizon. I go intra week because again, I'm, I'm trying to get that intrinsic value. So the way I look at it is there's no point for me to pay next week's premium or a month away premium if I'm going as if I'm trying to get as close to intrinsic as I can with the lowest possible um, price paid, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yep. That, that makes sense to me. So, so, yeah. so let me, let me try to recap it because again, I'm the guy who slows things down, um, down. and, and we'll, we'll pull the chart back up in, in a minute here, guys. But, but basically, so, so Matt is, is taking his positions with options and he's, he's buying them in the money. Uh, that that gives him a, a, the the best combination of leverage and not having to overpay when when he uses the weekly option or sorry the option expiring at the end of the week and I imagine that that if a setup isn't looking like like it's uh, uh, you you're, you're not holding these these options through expiration right if if you want to no, keep never. the position on then then you're you're I'll closing the trade and buying the next week yeah you roll it that's that right? i mean i do that all the time yeah i i get that question a lot actually that's yeah. a very common question with with my approach with the the strategy that i use it's a very common question because people get tripped out about end of week and stuff like that um but when you're when you're trying to get as close to intrinsic as possible if it, you're getting toward you know it's if the market closes at 4 p.m. eastern and it's you know 3:30 
and I still have a position, chances are I'm going to sell the position for that week and just kind of roll it into the next week. If I'm still bullish, you know, if I'm still confident in that trade, I'm just going to roll it up into the next week. Um, yep, but, yeah. and, I, and I see a question in the chat. It's, it's a, we'll, we'll do this one more time. Then I promise we'll get back to the chart. Uh, but it basically, the, the question is, you know, your, your, your time decay is, is high with weekly options. But, but, but that, that's, that's the beauty of, of having these in the money contracts, right? It's right. not like we're buying it five, ten dollars above where the stock is trading at, and we need the price to hit this week in order to make money. When, right. If the stock's at 94 and we're buying calls at 80, right? The, the option is probably going to be priced somewhere around 14 bucks pretty much through the end of the week that, you know, obviously fluctuating as the price of the stock moves, but we're not paying some sort of crazy premium for, for the uh, right. time. The thing. I think especially with the new kind of, we'll call it like the new generate, the new era of trading. Um, I'm sure anybody in chat or anybody watching this right now is aware of like the rise of the retail trader. Everybody's, everybody's trading now. And it's awesome. It's super, it's, it, I mean, anybody getting involved with the, the stock market at any age uh, is a beautiful thing. But something that I, I, I've noticed over the last year, as we've got more, uh, I don't know what the right word, the young eyes, fresh mm -hmm. eyes, people gravitate towards the cheaper options contracts. Why? Because they're cheaper. You're, and why would you pay 20 bucks or 10 bucks for an options contract when you could buy it for a dollar or 50 cents? The problem with that is that, yeah, it's cheaper, but your chance of that trade working out is exponentially lower than if you're using a strategy, say, like this, where you have a setup, you know what your intrinsic value is. Uh, and again, that's not to say, you know, if this if this gaps down tomorrow to eighty five dollars, all of a sudden I'm eighty. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm five dollars out of the money. So, yeah, there's still risk involved. There's always risk involved. But it, it, it helps mitigate that risk a little bit, especially versus the, op, the, um, the out of the money and the far out of the money, which, again, newer traders like to gravitate toward that, especially if you're trading with a smaller account. We've all been there. All right, my first two years trading, I had a small account. Um, I wasn't into options at the time, but I know, I know damn well mm -hmm. if I was into options, I would have been leaning toward the cheap contracts out of the money, something far mm -hmm. more risky that probably works out one out of a hundred times if you're lucky. So, yeah. and, and so, something that, that I'll add, and then and then let, let's let's get back to the setup in RCL. But, but something else that, that I'll add uh, is that now that commissions are free, smaller accounts can replicate these same strategies for the most part. I mean, you need to have some capital, right? But but it, it's not like like the days of old where hey, you had two thousand dollars in an account. Each trade is going to cost you ten dollars each way, so you need to be making you know ten percent on every single trade oh, and not missing man. in order to to grow your account at all. But with, without any commissions, it. yes, to me to too. Like yes. my first couple of years, I was like, okay, I've got five hundred bucks in this trade, and I know if I you know if I scale out two parts at a time, I'm paying twenty bucks. It was killer, man. Oh, commission fees were so killer. Yeah, so 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 I had. Uh, l l l I'm gonna put my screen back on so you have the calculator. Yeah. So 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 my first two accounts, which I blew up, were five hundred dollars a piece. And I blew them both up. Learned my lessons. Okay. You paid uh, but, but dollars for a lesson. That's that's the way you look at it. Exactly right. But but it was seven dollars to trade each way, and so so you know fourteen dollars to to get in and then to get out. By five hundred bucks, so I was I was paying three percent of my total account value just on commissions to get in and out, right? And so if I hold a basket of five stocks, right, that's fifteen percent of my account value j just on commissions. Yeah. And, and let and let's say I, I again I was newer, right? Let's say four out of five go against me. Now I'm really in the hole, and, and so that's one of the joys of you know the, the this commission free environment. Is that you know so some of these strategies that that Matt's talked about, I'm talking about, etc., can, can still be replicated with smaller accounts. But all right, let let let's get back to to this this chart, that this this setup on RCL. Um, you know, if if anybody is is just joining us, uh, you know, we're 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 looking at at Royal Caribbean right now. We're going um, on a cruise, baby. We're going on a cruise. Let's go. Not, not the cruise that gets stuck because everybody gets COVID and you're stranded at sea for months. We're going on a cruise with the stock. Uh, so, so, so you identified this channel. Um, uh, can, can I guess just just take us through how you identified the channel really quickly? Sure. 
Um, and, and then, you know, what will you look for on the upside to, to give you some more conviction in the stock? And, and then, you know, what, what are you going to look for to, to get out of the trade? Sure. Oh man, that arrow is generous over there. That, 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 that changed. I didn't draw that like that. Um, yep. but anyways, and, and you know, what? I'm going to ask if you could make it a little bit bigger for us, that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, um, this should, this should do the trick, I think. Oh yeah, there we go. Now that's a big chart. If that doesn't deserve a, a like out of the chat, I don't know what does, but all right, keep going. Let me, uh, let me actually, I'm going to get rid of these boxes real quick. Go back, go back. And then we're going to do one year, six months. All right, here we go. So yeah, so kind of how I identify this. Um, there, there's a few ways that, that I scan or, or come up with my watch list. Um, one of, one of those ways is kind of just when, when you have a hot stock or you have a big sector move or something like that, and something comes up on radar, I kind of, and, and a lot of times I'll miss the first move. I'll miss the bulk of the first move. Uh, and the beauty of that though, is you might miss the first move, but there, there is always the potential for a second or maybe a third or fourth move. Right. So this kind of went into that category. I mean, I've had this on one of my watch lists for a, about a year now, since they started washing um, about this time last year, you saw the huge, huge pullback, 80%, 80% drawdown. So those, those, I, I call them the, the travel stocks or the social closeness stocks, um, airlines, cruise lines, hotels, stuff like that. Um, so I have watch lists for everything and I go through the watch lists. I mean, I, I keep tabs on all of these stock on, on, on all the setups. Um, and so the beauty of keeping tabs on them also is you put price alerts for those who, who know what price alerts are, but for those who don't know what price alerts are, whatever application you're using to trade your stocks, say there's a high, like, right. I'll just, I'll do a couple outlines right here or right here or right here, you know what those highs are. So they were about, I don't know, let's just say it was 80 bucks or $75, whatever. You go into the application and you put in custom alerts for the stock RCL when it crosses over price XYZ. So you have price alerts and I have thousands and thousands and thousands of price alerts across all kinds of stocks, across all kinds of sectors. Um, so that and if helped. you're just getting started, I'll, I'll give the advice of start with some small basket of companies, yeah. um, you know, and, and even if you're, you're not sophisticated enough to set up alerts on them yet, uh, you get in the habit of looking at the charts every day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, I, I, again, that's another question I get a lot. It's like, how do I get started? You get started by just getting started. You just got to get your, you got to get your feet wet, um, get some trial and error under your belt and, and start, I mean, pattern recognition and stuff like that. It just takes time. You put your reps in and uh, before you know it, you start to recognize some things. Um, exactly. Start with 10 stocks that, that you look at every single day and you're going to find if, if you're consistent and you're serious about this, that's going to grow to a hundred stocks pretty damn quickly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so no, faster seriously. than you'd expect it. Uh, Luke's preaching it. That's it's exactly right. So for me, I have gee, I don't know, maybe 40 watch lists that are very distinct with, you know, a sector or, uh, or a hot theme or something like that. Um, so what's going to happen is maybe sometimes I'll do it during the day, but especially at the end of the day or, or in the evening, I'll quickly flip through my watch lists. And if I see any kind of price anomalies or any, or any um, chart anomalies, I'll then pull up the daily chart and then if it still looks interesting, then I'll throw in alerts and then I'll kind of go over to what I call my main watch list and then I'll add it to my main watch list. But anyway, with something like RCL specifically, um, let's see. So this would have been early February. So this, this move here, right? This, these couple candlesticks here, which I just highlighted. So we had, we had this move in the fall, got us to this high pulled back, had a, had a brief digestion phase, kind of broke down a bit here, but it recovered. So the high that I was paying attention to was this high. Whoops, let me try to, there we go. 
So this high, right at this line. So right around $77, okay? Why was that an important level? It was an important level because we got, and again, we go back to talking about the supply and demand, the channel, right? We saw supply, we saw supply, and it got rejected, okay? So to me, what became very important to this chart was if we could get up to that same supply level, that same resistance level, I call them inflection breaks, the, the, the breaks in the charts where you've rounded out a bit and you kind of, you have a couple highs, like I just showed, and then maybe it breaks down a little bit and then it comes back up, back to that supply. And then you saw a few days of digestion and then bang, rips through it. So it became one of those main type of watches. And again, several minutes I talked about, sometimes I miss the first move. And this was one of them. I missed this move. I, I don't think I made a single dime off of this initial move. Um, you know, there was, I made, I made some good trades, some, something like here and back here and a couple other times on this name, but a month ago on, on this move specifically, I didn't make money. So instead what I do is I add it to a specific watch list. I keep close tabs on it and I wait for these kind of micro channels to form like I outlined right here, this, this micro channel from a week ago, a week, a week ago or so. Um, and that's kind of the, the conclusions that yeah. I, and, and I'm just going to say, so basically you, you, let me try to recap it. And again, sorry guys, I'm the slow down guy, but, but you saw the breakout happen. You, you, you saw the price move sideways, AKA consolidate for a period of time. Yep. Uh, and, and then, you know, that was your indication as to this thing could break higher. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you have, you talk about macro, you talk about micro trends, but talk about macro trends. The macro trend since early last spring has been up. We have, we have plenty of, of micro channels that go downward with downward pressure, but we've broken to the upside of every single one essentially over the last year or so. Um, so with that, and again, you never want to have you don't want to have bias as a trader. Um, uh, again, bias kind of implies emotions, but you want to you want to look at these patterns and from previous data you can conclude, or I'm sorry, you can't conclude. You can you can kind of infer or extrapolate and kind of predict future moves. Um, again, it's not it's never going to be exactly the way you want it to or work out the ex exact way you want it to. If it did. Um, we'd all be rich and, and living on private islands. So that's not how it works. But um, I guess my point is, is the macro trend for the last year has been up. So with that being said, you got another kind of example of this consolidation, this kind of downward uh, sloping pressure. And now today breaking through that little micro channel to the upside. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like I talked about a lot. I hope I didn't. I hope it didn't talk too much. I hope I hope that I hope that stuck with people. Uh, I mean, if I got it, then I hope everybody else did. Or if not, they have the video and they can keep replaying. Okay, it. cool. There we yeah. go. But no, I mean that's and, and isn't it amazing too? I'm just taking a step back for a second. Isn't it amazing how quickly an hour goes by? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> when we were getting on today, I was like, like you're having fun, you know, you're exactly. I'm like, 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 check this out. I'm making like a full list of notes and like stuff to make sure we have enough to go through. We we're like still on step one. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so when, when we do this again, which hopefully we, we can do another session later this week. Um, when, when we do this again, I mean, we, we have so much material to go through. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot to go through. Cause there's, a, I mean, charts are ever changing. Um, sectors rotate money rotation. It's ever changing. I mean, there's always stuff to talk about. Um, what I was going to show you real quickly. Yeah, let's check it but, out. Um, I was going to compare. If sorry, you want us to look at it, it's probably a good thing to look at. <laughs> I, I know there, there, there's a handful of people in the chat who, who might not be as familiar with you. Uh, but but if there's something that, that you want to look at, it's probably a good thing. Cool. So the um, the comparison I was going to draw to was our, was uh, UAL, which again, UAL, it's not it's not a cruise line. It's a it's an airline, obviously. But yep. you see with UAL and, and UAL, uh, that's uh, United, right? Yeah. U United, United Airlines. U UAL is a ticker. I'm going to drop it in the chat. So again, UAL, RCL, 
they are not the same niche within the sector, but they're they're both travel stocks. They're both leisure, travel, uh, social closeness related, right? When you're on an airline, you're close together and you're traveling somewhere. When you're on a cruise line, you're close together, you're traveling somewhere. So they're very, very, very similar. Uh, they're different, but very similar. A lot more similarities than there are differences. Um, anyways, with something like UAL, uh, again, this was kind of uh, a, a decent a decent setup for me going into this week. I had a, I had a nice little trade on this one. Um, unfortunately, I didn't, and again, hindsight's always 2020, and you always think after the move, dang, I didn't have enough. But it was a classic example of that. This morning with the gap up, I found myself not having enough um, skin in the game from last week. Anyways, the good news is this setup kind of reminds me of how RCL is setting up. Um, RCLs, and again, I've, I've drawn kind of the, the more ma- the, the micro channels and the micro trends, but with this, it's kind of a, more of a box. It's a, it's a little bit more broad. It's a bigger picture, um, okay. but it still kind of represents the same thing. So UAL, yeah, and if you can see my cursor from February up to early March, you had the kind of steady, steady run up. And then you had that multiple week period with the clear, with the clear supply, the clear supply, supply, and then supply. And then today you had the gap up over that channel. Um, and then with RCL, you kind of have something similar starting to develop. Supply kind of got close to that upper end supply. Today, represented by today's candlestick, you have a long upper wick. So you kind of see that supply represented again. Um, So that's why with something like RCL, I say there's no rush as long as this trend holds in place over the next week or two weeks um, and can can continue to trade kind of within this general shape here. That's kind of what I was, what I was drawing. Like if it can kind of continue to consolidate with a, with a higher base, you know, this could do something similar to what UAL did today, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So the candlestick on UAL today, you know, plus 8%, that's a solid, that's a solid move. It's a huge day. It's a huge day. Um, RCL, if it consolidates similar, similar to what you saw with UAL for a couple more days, RCL could put in an 8% day. um, And, you know, an 8% day from where we are. And again, this is just, spitball and random stuff eight eight percent from here is up to 103 103 dollars that's a and you're talking options contracts you know you can get some very very lucrative returns on something like that so that's just kind of the comparison i draw to um and again all right you had boeing from a week ago big technical breakout there so there's a lot of um there's a lot of similar uh sector stocks uh setups similar to something like RCL, uh, where, whereas RCL hasn't had the move yet and others have. So again, it's just a, it's one of the many ways to approach, uh, uh, a thesis behind your trade. Yeah. And, 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 and let, let, let's look at one more. Well, while we're talking about these travel stocks, you threw out the sticker earlier, I was sort of just hammering through charts Yeah, and saw a pretty one, uh, M-A-R. Yeah. Ma- Marriott. Marriott. Yep. Yeah. And, and 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 can you pull up like like a two year chart on this uh, yeah, yeah, with yeah. weekly candles? Yeah, I mean same thing. You you got it. You you nailed it exactly. It falls under the same general category. Look at the level this thing is at. It's beautiful. I mean it's r- sitting right at its its pre COVID high. I mean right yeah. freaking there. It's it's essentially so this it's funny like um, one of the ways that I. So you're talking about pre-COVID highs. Okay, so here's something fun that you can do sometimes. So you have all of this chart data from the last year that from that huge washout that, um, I, of course, talking about here, where you had that washout on Marriott from like, uh, what, 150 down to $50. What is that, a 60 plus percent washout? Yep. Huge, huge drawdown. Um, so sometimes for simplicity's sake, I'll just kind of, I'll go in here and I'll do something like this. I'll kind of just ignore that chart data. Um, and then with that being said, you can kind of just look at it like this as if like it just traded in like kind of a channel like this over the last year. 
it's just a it's just a way to kind of block out the noise if you will okay that's interesting that's that's not something i've done before yeah so again this is kind of just garbage if you i mean we had this garbage washout and now we've spent a year retracing those steps going uh, sideways and now we're kind of back up to the the COVID highs like you said so um it's just it's just an interesting perspective to look at it from but nonetheless the point is the same we spent the last year recovering and now we're back up to pre-COVID highs um and I'm curious what all-time I feel like all-time highs are right here too yeah I mean all-time highs are right there at 160. um so yeah I mean it, it goes right in line with like and I mean, you can make the argument that this is a much more constructive technical setup than something like Royal Caribbean, which is still a ways away from its pre-COVID highs. So yeah, I mean, good, yeah. good, good, um, good pattern recognition there. You call it, you nailed that one exactly. Yeah, and and and, and so so again, me doing my slowdown thing, guys. So 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 ticker MAR uh, Marriott. Right, we we see the stock sitting pretty much right at where where its highs were before COVID, um, and 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 the thought process is okay. If it breaks above those levels, it should have room to run, uh, and, until the next stopping point is the Marriott, um, Hyatt. I think it's H Y T. Uh, no. Uh, H ticker H. H. That's all you got. Yeah. You get one letter. That's it. There it is, Hyatt. Yeah, but again, it's essentially the same type of setup as Marriott. I mean, they're, they're all, there's differences, but similarities also. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, same kind of deal. Yep. So, all right. That, that takes us to, to the end of this segment. And you know, it's fun doing something new, right? You got to sprinkle a little technicals in there every now and then broaden your horizon. Uh, I like it, man. So, so, so we, so, so check this out, but, but before, before you came on and before I came on, we did like like fundamental how to value a company, how, how to how to dig deep. Then then you know you take us through through technicals and trade setups. Yeah. And now we're about to get into cryptos and NFTs in, in our next hour. Oh my god, I'm gonna have to freaking awesome, isn't it? And, and tune in for that because NFTs are just they're just so far over my my brain capacity. I just I I can't justify them or rationalize them or, but. Yep. If there's money to be made, then it's I'm going to be paying attention to it. So it's it, they're interesting. Put it that way. They're interesting. I'm going to tune in for that segment for sure, though. That sounds cool. Absolutely. And two two chats I want to call out. Somebody saying VYGVF. That's my favorite crypto stock. So Let I don't know go. what the question is. I still like it. Oh, no, what don't look mean? at the chart. Don't look at the chart. Don't look at the chart. OK, I won't. All right. Uh, and, and then the second one, Matt, you, you, are, you are the goat for this. So, hey. so hell yeah. <laughs> uh, how yeah, how how do people stay in touch? Get, you know, I'll, I'll drop the Twitter here in the chat. I don't I don't know if there's anything else that you want to point folks towards. Yeah, no, just my Twitter handle. Um, I mean, I try to put YouTube videos up at least once a week or every other week. I'm try I've been trying to get into that more recently. But yeah, I mean, my Twitter my Twitter handle is flex underscore underscore trades, um, and that's where I that's where I anything that you just watch me talk about over the last hour. That's where that's where I post it. Boom! Perfect on Twitter profile. Yep. All right, and I said not to look at that chart for VYGVF. Go to my Twitter if you want info on that. <laughs> no, the, the chart's not going to tell you anything on that one. I'm going to pull but, it up, dude. I'm going to I'm going to pull it up. I got to see. All right. It. Whenever you look at it, I'm just going to say my average price is fifty cents. All right. Cool. Uh, what is but it like again? Penny or <laughs> no? It's like twenty bucks. <laughs> okay. Oh shit. But the chart's not going to tell you. You're going to see this chart, and you're going to be like, "Is this a fraudulent?" The the, the stock went from making two hundred and fifty thousand a quarter to fifty million a quarter in two quarters. Is it's it, like the it, craziest shit that's ever happened in the like for any stock, stock or like an Australian stock? What it, it's it's Canadian and OTC listed. I own the Canadian yeah. ticker. It, it's okay. you know like a nice two and a half billion dollar market cap. So so it's decent wow. size. But nice. basically, it's it's a crypto trading brokerage. Um, and, and so their, their their whole thing is, you know, it, it's sort of like they want to be the Robin Hood for, for crypto trading, right? Like like more sophisticated than sort of the simple crypto trading that you can do on a Robin Hood. And, and so when, when crypto started getting legs, they, they rolled product to market. They just exploded in, in users. So I'm trying to think. All right, we can talk more about that one. Chart. I recognize this chart, but I forget. They must have did a ticker change at some point. I'm curious. 
They, they, they might have. To but, like maybe switch. I don't know. I recognize yeah. the chart because I know I know all the crypto charts, but this one you you threw at me, and I was like, huh, I don't I don't know that one. Yeah. So so I mean, there's a lot of cattle. So so all right. God, we're going to do it. And then, we, then we're going to move on to crypto and NFTs. But <laughs> all right, like, like I'm like the analyst of record on this stock because there's no, there's not really any analyst coverage. There's three analysts who cover it, but I, I you're one of digging them. deep. Exactly. I'm one of three. <laughs> um, but, but, but basically, so, so they've already earned $30 million this quarter through the end of February. We know That's that. Nuts. Just the, from, the, 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 just from crypto trading, whenever there's a crypto transaction, they get paid. It's it's commission okay. free, but but if they can fill your order better than they can quote yeah, it to yeah. you, it's kind of like a market maker. Exactly. Money. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um. So 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 they already made thirty million dollars through February. The estimate for the quarter is only forty one million dollars, and, and we've seen what's happened to the price of Bitcoin. Right, getting to sixty thousand, you get another wave of FOMO in there. So there's no reason one why they, they shouldn't blow out what expectations for the quarter. Uh. Two, the 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 thirty million that they made so far this quarter already. That they had to put a cap on the users entering the stock or, or entering the product, right? They had to put on a waiting list because there was just too many people coming in all at once. So now that's yeah. off. So that's another thing where, okay, they, they, they could blow that. past that number even more. Um, and, and then and then a couple other things we have going for it. Coinbase IPO. Coinbase is getting priced at 50 times sales right now. The stock's trading at less than 10 times sales. So it's when that Coinbase oh, IPO they'll happens. they will get sympathy from the Coinbase. Exactly. Yeah. And you have uplisting potential, right? It trades yeah. Canadian and OTC. It's now $2.5 billion market cap. There's no reason why it shouldn't be able to uplist in NASDAQ. It, so, it, it likely will then. Yeah, I could see that happening. So, all yeah. right. Cool. Yeah. No, that's that's cool. That's interesting stuff. When is the Coinbase IPO, by the way? Wasn't that supposed to be Q1? Uh, They filed, I would guess, within the next month or so. I don't know definitively. If anybody out there in the chat, Zinger Nation, if you guys know, drop us in there. I thought I thought originally when I first read about it, it was Q1. But again, with the deba- with the debauchery of the whole GameStop situation, the um, man did they did they shoot themselves in the foot a bit there? That's, I know. I think Robinhood is still going to have its IPO. Yeah, it was supposed to this year. I think it's still going to happen despite the GameStop thing, but we'll see. But again, it's like something like that, like Coinbase, Robinhood. Like, are those IPOs going to do well now that like we have something like Robinhood situation? Like, I don't know. You know, like again, you talk sympathy. Like, is Coinbase going to have sympathy off something like that? It's good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or what they should do is they they should uh, (laughs) they should announce stock trading and then do it like a week later. That'd be hilarious, but that's cool. cool. All right, Matt. Thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Uh, uh, Producer AB, can can you drop the the link to his Twitter there in the chat? Show show him some love, guys. Smash that like button, guys. In 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 light, like I teased just a second ago, we are we are going to move on to to some crypto. We're going to talk crypto. We're going to talk NFTs. We're keeping the education going all night, baby. This is our first day here at Benzing. We're doing twelve hours straight of live content. Start at 8 a.m. Eastern. We're going to 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're, we're about to bring Ruel on for another Ruel report. Um, but I want to play my pump-up video and also take a second to, like, drink some water. So we're going to hit the pump-up video. We're going to bring Ruel on. We're going to talk crypto and NFT. Let's get ready to rumble! The Nation jam-packed show today. Peloton up 5%. What's up, Discipline Investor? We got Benzinga CEO Jason Raznick here with us. The man, the myth, the legend, Tom Nash. Peter Schiff on the Power Hour with us live today. Interesting, different, unique, innovative companies. Mia, you are live with us on the Power Hour. What's up? Thank you so much for inviting me on. Jessica Billingley, that is the CEO of Aperna. The best trade idea resource out there. Boom! Time for the Ruel report. We're we're talking. We're gonna talk crypto. We're gonna talk NFTs. Maybe you'll give us some good stocks you like. We're gonna talk Cardano, my my favorite crypto right now. But all right, what's up, man? How you doing? What's Joining going us on? from Arizona. Still cold here in Michigan, but getting warmer. What what's up in your world? Oh, not much. You know, just chilling. Yep. There we go. There we go. I have to say. Last week, some of our crypto picks were absolutely great. There we go. Um, Cardano being one of them? Heck yeah. Well, Car- Cardano, we've been on that since like 30 cents. But um, One Harmony, that went up 200% since last week. All right. We- wait, wait, wait. Hold on. 
All right. Do you, do you have crypto charts you can share with us? Oh yeah. All right. So so let's look at this harmony chart and give us the 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 symbol or the pair to look at, and then also tell tell us why you like this one. Because in addition to, to you feeding us with education every Monday, guys, we do this every Monday if if, if you're new and just tuning in. But in addition to you feeding us information every Monday, uh, like, like I want to know what sorts of things should we be looking at to identify these ourselves? Okay, great. I love it when you do that, Luke. You're, you're so good at uh, recreating conversations. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Austin in the chat showing up. He says, Ruel, let's go. All right, sweet. So sharing the screen, let me know when you guys can see it. All right, we have it. Okay, so this is one harmony, and I'm trying to get these uh, symbols inside of Benzinga Pro. My oh. life will be complete when that happens. So, we Aaron, gotta... can, we, can we make that happen next week? So, yeah, he says yes. So let's see. This is the three-hour chart. All right. So, so this is harmony again, guys. If you're just tuning in, we're talking crypto. Smash that like button. Uh, ticker here, it looks like it's uh, one, O-N-E, Oscar November Echo. Is that is that right? If so, I'm going to drop it in the chat. Yep. And um, basically what this is, is it's Harmony's uh, ticker symbol plus Tether. And Tether is a stable coin that's pegged to the U.S. dollar. So so basically Harmony's worth nine cents a, a, a crypto or, or coin. And uh, since last week... When we talked about it, it was about it like, well, actually, we talked about it like three weeks ago, and it was like at three cents. So it's up 200% since, since we talked about it. And uh, the reason. And, and why so, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, all right, we have the win. You, you know, let's celebrate the win. Here, let's get you nice and big on the screen. All right. You gave us a hot ticker. I didn't get into it. So, whatever. I'm not that thrilled, but <laughs> oh, you gave us a big win. Um, you know, but but for somebody like myself who who isn't into the crypto market as much, right? I'm a stock junkie. Yeah. I know stocks all day. They, you know, any symbol, I'd love to talk about it. But for somebody who like myself who isn't that deep into the crypto market, um, but obviously would love to to grab these these 200 percent gains, what sorts of things do you look at to to give you an indication that hey, th this this coin, this currency, this whatever digital asset is interesting? Right now. Um, the biggest thing is um, Ethereum has a huge problem with scalability and gas prices. And gas prices is basically like you can think of it as a surcharge for anything that you do on the network. So <clears throat> anything that's solving this problem or has a separate network that won't have this problem is pretty much blowing up. Okay. Got it. And okay, so 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 basically, let, let, let's recap this. So because you're in the loop on the crypto space, you know something that's being widely discussed is is you know gas fees on Ethereum are too expensive. So so competitors that that's that's where you well, some money is likely to flow into. And again, the definition of gas fees is is how expensive it is to to actually use or, or transact in that currency. Um, you know, it, which is is a problem that that Ethereum is facing right now. Correct. Okay. All right. So, there we go. I don't even yeah. know if you're planning on talking about this, but but when you started off by saying, "Hey, I've got a 200% one week winner that I gave out on the show last week," I, I've got to make you talk us through it. No, nah, look, you do what you do, and you do it great. Love it. <laughs> awesome, man. Okay, so that kind of segues us into like the NFT world, right? So, um. Here are two NFT um, places that you can uh, get NFTs, and this is rareable and super rare. Wait, super rare? And I don't use these personally because you can only pay in Ethereum. And like I said, they have ridiculous gas prices. Like, let me see if I can just click on something right quick and try to buy it, and you, you'd see what I mean. Okay, whatever the hell this is. Enter my bid. Let's say I'm going to enter, which is like $4 or something ridiculous. Okay. My MetaMask pops up. 
All right, this is cool. So, so you're you're buying an an NFT live right now and showing us how it works, basically, or or you're you're pretending to, and we're gonna pull out last minute, something along right. those lines. Okay? Exactly. And uh, this just so happens that it gave a a decent gas fee of fourteen dollars, but normally it would be way more, and it might have to do. Wait, with wait, 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 wait. But but oh, you're sorry. trying to buy something for four bucks. And it costs you fourteen dollars of transaction fees. Oh yeah, and that's cheap for what it's been. Okay. And I, I'm just curious if I if I tried to pay more, how much it would it would do? Okay. So now you're putting in what is that like a hundred and seventy bucks? <laughs> yep. So okay. so it just ha so happens the gas fees right now are like fourteen dollars, but that's cheap. I've seen it like where it's like $80. Yep. Straight All right. Jet. And again, guys, so we, we, yeah. And we, we have this awesome, uh, awesome comment in the chat, right. From, from solar up. <laughs> He's saying, you know, uh, he, he keeps hearing about gas prices or, or she keeps hearing about gas prices. And, and this is exactly what we're showcasing, how much it costs to transact in a currency. Um, so, so that, that was an awesome demo and in, in I think helps us all who, who again aren't in the crypto space like you are to understand it where you know you're yeah. trying to buy something for four bucks and then it's gonna cost you fourteen dollars to actually do that transaction. Exactly. So, so your four went to eighteen pretty freaking quick. Right. So now you get things like nifty, nifty gateway. This one, this site is really awesome because they offer right. you the ability to pay with actual cash. And um it's all right, but, but let's let let's define NFTs really quick, and then and then let's look sure. at it. Is that okay? Yeah, for sure. So NFTs are um, what it stands for is non fungible tokens, and what that was meant to be is a token that doesn't have a necessarily cash value. So um, a token that would just be representative of something. Um, so so what has grown to mean, and and basically what it means practically is um, any type of like digital art, um, like so, as you can see. So um, what this looks like in, in these worlds are basically almost like a, a, P, a PNG or a GIF or a small, like um, a small file that's gonna either animate or play some music. And um, what they've been doing uh, most recently is um, having artists different type of artists put music on the NFTs that would only be released on the NFT. So, so basically it, it, it's a digital piece of artwork is, is, I mean, there's other forms that can take, but that's, that's, I think what's cited most commonly. Yeah. Um, the question that people always ask, why does this have any value? I don't get it. Then the thing that I'll turn around and say to you is why do baseball cards have any value, right? You, you exactly. can just print out a picture of Babe Ruth. I could print out a pretty damn good printer. I've got that laser jet, right? You make it the same size and put it up on my wall. Um, you know, so, so, so it's a similar sort of function. And then what I think you're about to take us through right now, Ruel, is, is the secondary marketplace for these. How do people actually buy and sell and trade these? Because it's a hot market with a ton of money going into it. And, and then can you give us, you, you, you showed us one marketplace already. Uh, can, can you get... What, what's the name of the first one? And then what's the name of the second one that, that you're about to take us through? Okay. So the first two were rareable and super rare. Wait, wait, rareable.com. So R A, mm -hmm. I want to put these in the chat, but somebody asked. So it's R A R A B L E.com. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Here it is. Okay. And then what's the second one? It is super rare. Super rare.com. All right. So these are two marketplaces for these NFTs. And and in NFTs, we, we we before we get into secondary marketplace, what you're looking at right now is you can buy like an initial offering, sort of like an IPO, where where like the artist will, will go out and raise money and sell sell the asset off, just like a company would go out and sell off stock to raise money for an IPO. And then you have the secondary marketplace where peer to peer can can trade it, set asset values, uh, etc. Okay, and now we have Nifty Gateway. <coughs> Nifty Gateway is really, really awesome. This is probably my favorite NFT site. Uh, one, because they have these scheduled drops and are basically like times when artists are going to premiere NFTs. 
Okay, so so you they tell you ahead of timing and zoom in on that. Can you just zoom in on, on one section of the web page really closely? Uh, let me see. If we can understand this. Again, if, if you guys are, are new to NFTs, this is the segment for you. Uh, the website's broken. It won't let me zoom in on that part. It only lets me zoom in. All right, here. We'll, we'll make it bigger. I'll, I'll read it off. So basically, this is saying on Tuesday, 316 at 1.30 p.m., Zack Snyder, Jack Snyder's Justice League and Boss Logic, which are artists of some sort, either musical or something else, I don't entirely know, but some sort of <laughs> artists are, are going to be releasing their NFTs uh, onto the marketplace where people will be able to go and, and buy and, and trade them. Exactly. So now um, if you go down here and these are the drops, and it just so happened that I did enter one of these drops. So we're kind of getting a live kind of view. <clears throat> and then some artists are really kind enough where they'd actually list things at a, as a dollar so people can buy them. But usually those are, are the ones that'll go into big old drawings where it's like, okay, 25 people will win this drawing where like 40,000 applied for it, entered the drawing. Yep. So um and if i go back here those are the ones that are kind of like the gallery ones and then they're ones called like open editions and the open editions anyone can kind of just buy it and that's what this oe stands for here okay so so, so, so when you're buying when you're buying nfts in the initial offering, which again, I think we can think about like an IPO where the creator is selling off the art, just like a company would sell off their shares. You, you can, there, there's two types of ways to get into it. One is you can enter into the drawings uh, and potentially be awarded the NFT. And then the other one is you can just buy it on the, the open market, correct? Right. And the open edition will be different than the drawing usually. Um, so these drawing ones are like, <laughs> just limited edition if you if you get in there and you get it you get it but so so how does this drawing work like 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 how how do you get into it uh so basically you, know, do you, do you pay for you, like a raffle ticket do, do you say no, you're no, gonna no, pay no. the no. full price if you get selected how does that work thank god they don't make you pay for a raffle ticket um we should probably like just strike that from the recording so nobody all right there's no you. raffle tickets okay <laughs> let's clarify uh, that um, but, but, um, so you just go into the drawing and you enter and, um, if like once the drawing's over, they give you about like 40 minutes, sometimes they'll give you like five minutes depending, and then they will just randomly choose. Okay. So wait, so, so can you show us one, <laughs> how you would click to enter and then what will you pay if, so, if you so get selected? So now, it's, now it's closed, but, um, Okay, so the one we went into, I think, is closed. So it won't let me go back in there, but I'll try. Uh, or you can show us a different one if, if there's a better one to look at. Okay, yep, this one allows you to enter. So go into the drawing, beep, bop, boop, you enter the drawing. And then if I was able to enter there, I would go in, I would enter my payment information, and it'll say you successfully entered the drawing. Okay. <laughs> now um and, and then if you get if you win the drawing right you're one of 25 people or however many there are who who have the chance to buy this what what's the price that you would you would end up paying for this one it would be a dollar and that's that's oh, really so that's, kind. okay so, so that's reasonable yeah. that's kind of this artist but some artists don't do that if you go back to if we go back to this drawing here this guy and he's Pretty known guy, I guess. He did some covers for Machine Gun Kelly, Young Thug, blah 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 blah. Um, so that would that that would strike me that this guy would probably have a following, where he would, you know, his stuff would sell. So his okay. is five hundred a pack. So you enter, you pay five hundred, and you get a pack. Okay, and a pack, I guess, is one of these one of these kitty arts. Yep. So, okay. So, so you're, you're staking up 500 bucks to buy this NFT. 
uh, and you're doing it either because you, you're going to own the art, it's yours, you can show it off, or because you're speculating on the price, you think that, hey, you know, this artist is, is going to appreciate in popularity or more money is going to flow into NFTs and you're just trying to rip this thing off for a 10 bagger, basically. Exactly. Exactly that, Luke. So usually you want to just <laughs> resell um, or you can hold on to it if you think that it will be really worth something. And we'll go into that later. I have like five guys that are really great um, that I've seen have been big, in my opinion, in the world. And there's one that can't be debated. Um, but but there's there's some that I believe are big in this NFT world. So I'll point them out afterwards. But All right, and I'm going to drop this question into the chat while, while you keep going well. But but if you guys have, have bought NFTs before, you've traded them before, <laughs> drop the one in the chat. If, if this is something that's totally new to you, you have not done it before, put in the two. I'm going to start us off with the two. Well, you'd be able to start us off with the one, but all right, keep, keep going. Okay, so now these are the open editions. So for however long they're open, if you pay for it and get this, you get it. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've noticed, because I've done this part before, um, I don't know how they do the minting, but I would assume they do it in a queue. So if you're one of the first people in here and you press buy, you're probably going to be the first person filled. Um, I was in the queue for a, a painting or for, for a NFT and uh, 4,000 people bought it. So you can imagine if you're trying to resell, um, you're at extreme dis disadvantage if you're like the 4,000th person or like the 3,099th person to get the piece uh which happened to me i was like i was like i was like somewhere near the end so um basically they have to go through and mint uh that's what they call it when they make it so they have to go through and mint oh i'm hearing my sound somewhere else okay so um so then what they want they mint it. oh my god I have an echo somewhere. Is that me? No, you you, I... sound, you sound okay to me. Okay, as long as I sound okay to you yeah, guys. Yeah, you, you sound fine to me. Producer AB keeps joining the stream. Okay, we so... just got to keep him out. That's fine. Okay, so then let's go back here. So so um, so um, what I noticed, I followed a, um, a minting all the way through because I was waiting to get my mint, right? <laughs> the people that went first had the best dibs on prices and uh, some things sold for double the price, triple the price. And um, basically you can kind of get a feel by watching the minting. And, I, and I'll show you guys afterwards how we can do that um, of watching the minting and, and seeing how to gauge the price and what you can sell for. I also looked at the, the um, price a couple of days later and um, they did sell for higher a couple of days later, later than what I let it all go for, but I, I let it go at cost because I, I, I didn't want to risk anything. You were running scared. <laughs> I, I didn't all been there. So, um, and at cost was like, I paid like three hundred and thirty three for it, and I, I got a bid for like four fifty. So there were like sixty dollars in fees or something like that. My math is probably not right on all of that, but. Basically, I had to pay sixty dollars in fees, and I got my cost back plus like a dollar. So, okay. so that's something to be aware of. If you're gonna if you're gonna buy it, there's gonna be like sixty dollars worth of fees. So, um, okay. So then, if we go on here and we pick a piece of art, I can show you how you would track who's bought, who's bought, and what the sales were and whatnot. So. Let's just go to the activity. <clears throat> so the activity here is probably is going to show you when something's going to be minted. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know. Can you guys see the pics at all, or are they? No, like... we don't see the pictures. Okay. Wait, do they show up on your screen? 
No, they don't. That's what I was oh, wondering. Okay. I would say but maybe what's... there's some crazy technology which blocks them from showing up because we also don't see them. Okay, so then let's go. Let's go in here and look at this picture. We're going to let's go. So global history. Global history will show you all the mintings of this of this guy, and we're going to do only sales. So if we start from the beginning, so 50 of these were minted and they minted them in random order, which is awesome because, you know, you, you wouldn't want, if the first person always got the first minted thing, that would be, that would kind of messed up. So um, they paid 1987 for it, a thousand, nine hundred eighty seven dollars for it and if i go out to like three two we'll find the last minting at some point here and again for anybody just joining us can can you remind us what what exactly <laughs> minting is or the minting means yes so minting means they basically they're generating the um nft for anyone who purchased it and okay. with this, you got stuff in the blockchain going on in the background, like, okay, who purchased it? Who purchased it for what what time it was purchased? So there's stuff in the blockchain going on in the background that kind of gives it a security and a certain amount of, um, um, just a, a certain amount of security and protection that, hey, this person purchased it and there's no shenanigans going on. Okay. So, All right, that's so cool. We don't like the shenanigans, especially when we're talking about, about assets and, and putting our money somewhere. So as you can see, the last minted price for this was about 2000 and someone purchased it for 5000 So there, there can be really great resale value. And this is Insides by Paul Jackson. So this was one of the ones that was up for grabs okay <clears throat> wow can you guys see it the art so, so this is the art i mean this thing is pretty awesome and uh i did some research on this guy because i was trying to debate if i was going to pay that much amount of money for this this guy's done like magic the gathering card art i don't know if you guys know about magic the gathering i played but um that card art is some of the beautiful the most beautiful card art ever and um well, let's just, just let's just go, because I, I think and and, and and I I want to pick up on something you were just mentioning, right? Which is you were doing some research on the artist when when making the decision as to whether or not you want to get into this NFT, right? How how do you know which one to buy, right? Versus ones where people see money going in and they're just throwing it out. Uh, exactly. I. I, I, I'm going to speculate as to what some of that research process looks like and tell me how close I am. But but All I would right. imagine that, that you know, you, you want to look at NFTs that they've done in the past, that they appreciated or depreciate, depreciated in price, and maybe more importantly, how much of a secondary market is there for them? You know, are, are people actually buying and selling these things on a secondary market? The, the other one that I'm going to guess is, you know, hey, d does this artist have some sort of track record or, or brand rec recognizability? That, that you know would, would cause them to, to have some value here um, and then the the third one I I don't know I, I guess those are sort of the two <laughs> I wanted to come up with three list of three are good but but those are the so, two things at least that I would think to look at so so look that would be that would be those would be the third levels would be like the the fourth and fifth things I would do what okay. do you think the first one would be oh God. I'm loving this guessing game, so let's just. <laughs> I don't know, chat. Throw it out there, chat. If 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 you have ideas, throw it out there. I, I want to see. I'm not sure what 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 the other one would be. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. No, nobody has it. Okay, starts with a T. You would want to search this place first. Starts with a T. Ends with a R. A Twitter. Twitter. Yes. I guessed it. Let's go. <laughs> Producer AB Twitter. is here for a reason. There Sitting in his dark room. Literally, he needs more daylight a, savings right. time. Yeah, here. Let me. This is the first place you want to check. Uh, what Luke's talking about is great too. 
because um you know you want to know if they have nft history but honestly if you just go on twitter and you find out oh who's this grimes person mm -hmm. uh okay so okay so you look all right so what are you looking at when you look at their twitter then like like how much of a following they have yeah, so you look and see how much of following they have. Oh wow, you got a million followers. So maybe their their art is worth something. And just to just to FYI, Grimes did make some um, NFTs, and her more popular thing, which she doesn't mention, which is pro probably really smart of her, is that she's Elon Musk's um, partner. Okay. So um, she put some uh, NFT work out and um, it went for a really good price. And um, sometimes it'll be people on here and they'll be putting out NFT work and they're combining with an artist. So it'll be like, okay, this musical band that has a following plus this NFT artist or this person plus that. So it was her plus, um, I believe some other NFT artist. So um, yeah, so if if they have like a million followers, or um, you know, there's someone who has a name behind them, pretty much you're probably going to be able to resell their NFT work. Okay, all right, that's helpful to know. And just like just like we were saying here with Paul Jackson, uh, he mentioned some of his stuff. Like, okay, he's done work for. Taurus, B.I.G., Marvel, Sci-Fi, Pearl Jam, everything. All right. Yeah. Definitely interesting. He had Magic the Gathering up here. He took it off, I guess. Excuse me. So, so yeah. And, and I, lo I love the chat saying you don't need to tell us about Grimes and Elon Musk. They know. <laughs> I don't know how grimy you guys get, so, you know. And, and another really good question. Uh, uh coming from aj in the chat he's asking do the artists get royalties if their nfts appreciate i would imagine that the answer is no because my understanding is that this behaves just like any other secondary market would behave but but no, you have a better answer than i do they oh all right royalty. they get somewhat royalty so um i never resold and resold uh um nft but it definitely when i when i sold it it said artist fees Okay, that's oh, awesome. So, so, so the me. artists are incentivized for the price of these to increase. Exactly. exactly. That's great. That okay. Of everything you just talked to us about, that's the most compelling case I think you made to me. It, is is the fact that that they have skin in the game just like I do? I think that's super interesting. Yep. So, so when I paid when I uh, sold the piece of art that I bought, so I, I believe the artist is going to get the main the like the most of the lump sum of the minting and then when i sold it there was an artist fee and like a transaction fee which i'm sure goes to nifty gateway in some portion okay, that's great so yes it, it the more times this is resold the more the artist gets um <clears throat> pay and um i did some research on nfts themselves and uh these graphic designers and people who make things like this they were saying like, this is a godsend for them because, you know, they don't make that much money. Yep. And it's really hard for them to get their work seen unless they try to put their work in like an art space. And really that's not what their work is meant for. It's meant for a digital space where you can actually see their work like move. And like, if you, we click on this, can you guys hear that? Yeah, we hear it. Don't you see me dancing? I guess you're sharing your screen, so probably not. Oh, am I yeah, not sharing my it. screen? No, no, no. We, we, we hear it. The audio is definitely there. I think we might have had enough, but the audio is definitely there. <laughs> so so that this type of work really isn't meant for an art space, really, anyway. So it's been a really good godsend for um, digital artists that they can um, they can like kind of really make a living now. Yep. Um, and, and then another question here. Uh, so, so NFT buyers are purchasing exclusive use license of the artwork, not the copyright of the image, correct? Correct. 
And and could could I go out if I buy you know some of this NFT artwork? Can I go out and and use it for some commercial purpose, or or is it only for mm. like personal consumption? And then like you know again, hopefully the piece of price think, appreciates and we do some trading. I don't think you can use it for a, a commercial purpose. I think the artist still holds rights to that, but I think there's some type of limitation on like okay, so say that they they said it was minted like a fifty out of whatever. I think they, there's some limitations on that. Like, okay, you said you were only going to mint 50. You can't really go mint more. Even though if you did mint more, um, the blockchain would say that it's this was minted at a different date. So it would never be the same as those 50 anyway. Um, but I, I do think there's some type of re regulations on that. Yep. You know, Very just awesome. the same as when they do I, like yeah. Yeah reprints of baseball cards like okay they they reprinted it but it's not the original so it's not worth the same mm -hmm. okay no that that that's that's super helpful um and uh that was a question that i had shout, shout out to solar up in the chat who who dropped that one to us but yeah i i was wondering on that as well so nifty's this is my favorite site my second favorite is this one called uh maker place Okay. Maker's Place, excuse me. They also have drops. And then, so you can click on these, figure out when the drops are coming. I haven't done a drop on here yet, but look at that art. That looks pretty cool. Looks like that's like Patrick Bateman and like Elon and I don't know who that is. I don't know who that is. Don't know who that is. Okay, and then I mean it is pretty cool stuff. Would I get bored watching it? Yes, one, I would. And somebody's asking, uh, uh, there's one uh guy. does this site that that you're on now use Ether, and then does does Nifty use Ether? Uh, Nifty, you can pay through Ether. Um, <clears throat> I I believe actually. I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you can pay with with Ether through Nifty, but Nifty is a product of um, Gemini Exchange, and that's that's the exchange that the Winklevoss twins run. So you can connect your Gemini to your Nifty. Okay. So let me let me just go ahead and try looking at that. It's not going to show all my card info, so it doesn't really matter. Um, okay. Well, we should did. Could, could you give us those first nine digits while you're at it or 12 digits? Uh. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, prepaid ETH. Okay. <laughs> so looks like you can put some ETH in here if you wanted to. So we got that one answered. Yep, awesome. And then with Maker Place, I know you can pay with both. And okay. they have like Boss Logic. This is a this is another guy who has really awesome uh, art. But you can see, like, look at this. Someone purchased this for thirty two k, thirty two point five k. Let me not even <laughs> forget about his extra five hundred dollars. So. And this was one of the drops from yesterday. And this Boss Logic guy seems to be a really popular guy because if we go back here to Nifty, he has a drop here with the Justice League. So, so he seems to be one of those really popular guys to to purchase. But um. So now if we go into guys to purchase, so Boss Logic is one of those guys. Uh, but the most, the guy that you can, if you find his stuff or you have the ability to raffle for his stuff, you want to do his stuff. His name is Beeple. I know you guys probably heard about like his whole little thing. So this Beeple guy. I hate it that people were kind of making them out. Like I saw headlines where it was just like, oh, this guy who drives a Corolla just 
he's a millionaire now through NFTs. It makes it sound like he just rolled up and went to town on Microsoft Paint or something like that. You know what I'm saying? But he's an actual digital artist. And like a lot of his concepts are really, they're really thought provoking. All so, right. You, you, you know what we should do, Ruel? Yes. In this time slot next week, when you're when you're back, we we should make an NFT <laughs> and figure out how to list it. Like you, it gives you a week to research how to go about doing it. You mentioned Microsoft Paint; that's where my idea came from. Uh, but I think it would help us to get the full circle, right? You just took us all the way through like the the equivalent of, of an NFT IPO through the secondary marketplace, through the research process, mm -hmm. but we haven't seen the creator side. So, you know, it could, could be Honestly. interesting. Honestly, I, I seriously want to make one a after this, like, since I'm not like monetized yet on YouTube. So honestly, go on my site, guys. Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's called uh, Black Rue Investing, or you can just look up my name, Ruel Black. And uh, just small YouTube at this point. But since I'm not monetized, I was thinking about making an NFT for people to just purchase if they wanted to. Yep. But... If you look at this Beeple art, I love this one. Tom Hanks beating the shit out of coronavirus. Can you guys see this? Yes, that is so good. So so I, 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 I would pay for that. All right, in the chat, question to the chat. If you guys would buy that piece of artwork, throw the one. If not, throw the two. <laughs> Keanu Reeves vaccine production. <laughs> that one I'm a little bit less interested in. The passion of the Elon. Like, he has some really cool stuff. And it's like, okay, this guy is obviously talented. It's not like, you know, somebody went to town on pain. Uh, where else? Oh, SpongeBob Hilary Pants was, I thought was pretty interesting too. So, if you look at some of this guy's stuff, um, so let's go on another site, OpenSea. I don't like that site quite as much. Um, it only lets you pay in Ether. Well, just needless to say, okay, so this one has a price of 100 ETH. So buy now for 100 ETH. And he can ask for that because one of his um, one of his artworks recently went for like 60, 69 million on some um, auction. Yeah, so, and and so so uh, how much? A hundred Ethereum. And what was Ethereum's last price? Like eighteen hundred bucks. Yes, it, and 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 it, it's not so that's really one hundred and eighty grand. Right. Yeah, that's expensive. Okay. So. People, uh, if you can find one of his like auctions and you can get in it, get in it. Um, Boss Logic's one, and if you go on his maker site, there's a guy I like. Uh, his name's Lumi. Okay. He just has good artwork. It's not like extraordinarily expensive. I just like all the colors and the shading and whatnot. You guys can see that. If you guys can see that. Yep. It's cool. It's interesting. And then one other person I think I'm forgetting about. Oh, Justin Roiland. Um, Rick and Morty guy. But Justin Roiland stuff is just because he's Justin Roiland. Like he he literally, it just looked like he just wrote it out with a pencil. And that was just kind of funny because he calls it the best I could do. So. <laughs> and it's just literally like he just made some some doodles. And this is Rick and Morty guy, guy who does all of that stuff. But if you look at this and you look at somebody bought this, like, and this was one of the drawing ones. 
where a hundred people got to to draw it. But if we go in here, like I was showing you guys before, view the listing in the marketplace. Click on the listing. Go to global history. Go to only sales. Thing last sold for like two thousand eight hundred eighty eight dollars. So like if you find good good artists and you're able to get it for like a a, a premium in a drawing or you buy an open edition that um, you can probably resell because I'm sure if if uh, he does an open edition, people will buy it and people will buy the resale. Um, it seems to be like a lucrative experience in my mind. All right, so 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 in all right, I, here's what I was gonna suggest is that I was gonna suggest it, you know in 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 these last 15 minutes or so that we have taking us through the okay, you're you're new to NFTs. What does it mean? How do you get started, et cetera? Um, and, unless you have something else that, that, that you want to run through. This has been super helpful for me, right? As, as again, I'm a, I'm a stock market junkie, you know, stock stuff, no inside and out. But, but when it comes to, to NFTs and understanding this market, it, it's sort of tough for me. And again, guys, uh, I'm going to shout it out. Smash that like button. I guess. Is, uh, do you guys have any questions? Is there, are there any questions from the crowd, from the audience? um I so, have a question, so yeah there, there's there's a handful yes. all right you do yours aaron so earlier you were talking about like the minting process and i know you gave the example with hold on i'm gonna take this thing off your face sorry <laughs> um the thing with the how your the one nft that you had was like the 17,000th of or 1700 out of how many that were made correct yes and so basically you were saying that it becomes less valuable the the higher the mint is of that well, your your direct like resale value, because honestly, just like everything, there's FOMO, right? And um, you can kind of think of it as like when an IPO kind of comes out, like everybody jumps on the IPO, and then the original people just sell, and it drops, and but it's, it's kind of like that. You're right, but basically, what what I'm wondering is like in a real simple example, let's say there's ten thousand of these of the same NFT minted the same picture minted so each minted version is its own nft would mm -hmm. the 9999th one sell for less than the 100th one that was minted very good question and yes yes that is correct but i'm um, curious like I, I don't does that work that way with like coins and stuff like say there's a hundred minted coins I don't know a lot about the market, but I'm pretty sure, you know, like all 100 of those minted coins, if there's only 100 in existence, all would be trading at like a similar value. Yes, but but you're you're, you're completely right. And very good question. And I, admit, uh, I meant to bring that up. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, yes. So the the first one is definitely going to be uh, sold for more than the ones down the line. And um, for example, the first the one of the Grimes ones, the first Grimes one went for like 50K. None, none have sold for that much. Uh, the first minted Grimes. So uh, I, guess, I guess my like follow up along that same, same question would be, is there a way then like, I know, you know, it's kind of all randomized, like how you do it, but if there would be a way to kind of ensure that you could get an early minted version of something, um, that would seem like an interesting way to invest in NFTs. Yeah, there's there's no way other than if you were going to buy after it was after it was minted. So say like, OK, I, I'm just I'm just going to well, I, I would think you wouldn't want to choose to not be in a drawing. You would want to be in the drawing right. even if you had a bad one. But you could choose to say, OK, I'm going to go buy all the ones and I'm just going to know that, um, OK, I'm going to go searching for ones that I feel are undervalued. And I'm going to, um, you know, buy them for because I think I can resell them. And um, there was a, there was someone I was watching on here, like a, an, an, um, a celebrity, and that's what they were doing. They were they were buying they were buying number ones and they were under under uh, under under underpriced number ones and reselling them for better prices. Got it. So you're saying basically the only way to ensure you get the number ones or one of the first 10 minted would be to wait 
for the secondary market once they're being sold. But at that point, you're already paying the premium for it being the first one minted or the first 10 minted or whatever it is. Correct. But also like a lot of these drops, a lot of these drops, they'll just um, auction off a one of one. So right. if we go to this one, <coughs> they auctioned off one. And oh, but you, wait, what is that? Does that mean it's like locked? Like you can't even see what it is till you buy it? No, no, no. That's just what this uh, art. Oh, it's is. actually that's the actual NFT. Is that lock thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But see, but see. Um, okay. They they have a bid here. You can place a bid, and the current highest bid is ten thousand, or you know. So. So that would be another way, like just buy buy uh, first editions. Um, Got it. But if you're if you're doing that, you, you you, I think you could clean up just buying. I would I would think it would be better to just go around and buy, uh, uh first first editions that are like one of thir- three hundred and eighty eight. I, I would think that would be a better use of ten k than to just auction it on one. Right. And and so I'm curious, I mean, I know we've been recently and in the past talking a lot about the uh, different crypto stocks that we have between Riot, SOS, Mara, Voyager, which obviously is Luke's favorite. But um, they, are there any stocks like that that are that like that for NFTs that have kind of popped up? I see someone in the in the comments mentioned SINGF. SINGF. Or, sorry, CI, CINGF. I don't know that one. Let's see. I mean, it's it's an, it's an OTC one. I can tell based off the ticker, but or it's not on the. Um, so I guess somehow this company, according to this person in the chat, is somehow related in the NFT, in the NFT right. game, if you want to say. Let's bring up Benzinga Pro. See what we can see about this. It says it's engaged investing in blockchain technologies with a focus on fintech. Okay, this is a good one. I don't know anything about this one, but I'll I'll definitely buy some tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, chat. Yeah, that's all. That's all the DD that Ruel needs is that it's a it's a blockchain stock. <laughs> Boom. Boom. <laughs> done. <laughs> blockchain stock, twenty five cents done. Twenty five cent done. Done deal. Someone else said Arc W. I guess maybe they have some exposure in that Arc Fund to NFT somehow. I would I would venture to say I would guess that any company that is invested into blockchain technologies that isn't uh you know a straight up Bitcoin miner or something like that will probably have something to do with NFTs if they're in the blockchain technologies. See, so most most of these are private. There were a couple that I saw today, but I don't know that they're related to any of the ones that I showed you. Oriental Culture Holding, um, Benzinga Pro said that they, they went up because they were re- related to some NFT stuff. Okay. See, so if you if you close out of that uh, watch list on the left, that up to the, sure, yeah, sure. close out of that, it'll make it a little bigger. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> But I don't know what platform. Pro.benzinga.com. Sorry, guys. Any chance to plug, I'll take it, especially when we're doing 12 hours of free streaming content all day today. Let's go. I don't know what type of platform they're related with. And I tried to find Are they they in the blockchain technology? Yeah, they're saying that they're they're trying to do like a blockchain like art thing. But I don't I don't know what online platform they 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 operate and i tried to find it and i didn't see anything interesting it doesn't yeah. say here there was one other one pcat or something like that so was that t-k-a-t okay. yep Well, this one was down today. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, no, so no, no, no. Look, look, look. It's it, it's up for the day, but it's down after hours. So that that, oh, that exactly. drop, that three percent drop that you see, that's after hours. The thing so made a hell God, of a look, run Thank today. God, Luke's here. That's why I'm here, baby. The thing doubled almost. Yeah, and I hear yes. my, here I am saying it went down on the day. Holy cow! But yeah. so Ruel, you don't have one particular stock that comes to mind. Like this is your go-to NFT stock. 
No. Um, the only thing that I, I'm looking for, I'm looking out for, I remember I said uh, Nifty was uh, owned by uh, Gemini. Uh huh. Is Gemini I'm waiting. Still- Gemini is supposed to have like a um, a SPAC eventually. Okay. Um, and and I like Gemini, and I like their AMP token. Um, so if you, they have an app, and uh, basically their whole thing is they're trying to make payment agnostic, um, and they're trying to do that through their AMP token, and the fact that they're relate, they have this nifty gateway, and this program is like just booming with MNFTs, and the fact that. The uh, Winkle Bros twins own them. What's your opinion on? Uh, I don't know how, how they say it. Zero, the the Overstock one. All right, and then that's oh, gonna be your last Overstock. question, Aaron. All right, that's my <laughs> last Overstock. question. That's my last question. I gotta get Ruel's opinion on that. <laughs> I I love Overstock, and uh, I I've I've definitely I mentioned them on my top stocks, and if we look at their earnings. Like, Sorry, look I'll, at their I'll, I'll, I'll take Luke off so it doesn't cover your face. There we go. So look at their earnings. So not only do they have T0 exchange where they sell Bitcoin, they also um, have Bitcoin on the like the ledger as an asset. Mm-hmm. So if you look at this, like, okay, so they're in the 300 millions, they're in the 400 millions. Boom. 700 million, 700 million, like almost 700 million, but definitely double this. Um, what is there not to like about Overstock? You know what I mean? When at one point they were earning this much and they were like at a hundred and something dollars, if we take it out to the year. So at some point they were at a hundred and twenty four dollars and they wow. weren't earning. They didn't have half the the revenue that they have now. You see, you see so. Um, so I'm 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 really big on Overstock. What do you think about Overstock, Luke? I think it's interesting. It's definitely <laughs> an interesting crypto play. And I see somebody in the chat saying, "How did they not go bank out of business years ago?" Well, they're back, baby, as a crypto play. Um, yeah, you gotta get Overstock, out. They, I think it's actually pretty interesting. I don't own it, um, but I definitely think it's interesting. It's definitely one one to dig deeper into for me. They have they have um, the e-commerce, but Along with the um, the crypto, they have that crypto exchange. They have their fingers in a lot more stuff than that. Like if you look at their um, their owner's presentation, they have their fingers in a lot of stuff. There you have it. So I, I, I'll check them out. And of course, you know, I love uh, Clean Spark and um, Mogo. I have that gentleman's bet with Raz that they'll get to $12. In Let's go. You're getting there, baby. We're, we're getting there. Raz, just I'm like the Rodney Dangerfield of uh of uh Benzinga. I, I gets no respect. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking us through this NFT deep dive. I did so that, that was awesome. That. Yes, exactly. Like NFT has been such a buzzword for like three weeks now. You actually took us through how they originate how the secondary market works, what you look for in analyzing them. So, so this was maybe the most useful session yet. For sure. For sure. All right. And, 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 and shout out to this last comment in the guys. chat. If somebody can make a profit, if, if something can make a profit I'm about it, no matter how short lived, that's exactly how I feel too. That's what we're all about. I'm we're a gamer. Trade ideas. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hit you guys with a couple crypto picks and all of these are uh, Ethereum killers. So um, Ada's on a pullback right now. They have an upcoming catalyst of having the uh, Gogan uh, release happening. And once they have Gogan, they'll have smart contracts and they'll be able to kind of have their own Ethereum network launch. So um, they were as high as like uh, 140 something. So they're on a pullback back to a dollar and they're kind of leveling out at that spot. I would definitely say pick up some Cardano now if you can. Awesome. That's, um, that's one should, that I like we too. Should, we should tease the other other two you were going to talk about and, and keep our keep our viewers waiting for next week to come back and watch them. 
hey, sounds good to me. What what else you got? Anything else for this Monday evening you got planned? Uh, probably cooking because uh, my wife gets hangry. We've we've spoken about that before. Um, probably maybe throw the football around with the kids. I'm in Arizona, so it's there pretty hot. It's pretty hot out there. And um, other than that, I might do um, a little research on uh, who these guys are for the next upcoming crypto drops. Beautiful. I love it. NFT drops. There we go. Say. Boom. All right, guys. I, I put the Twitter handles in the chat. Throw us a follow. Subscribe to the stream. Like the stream. We, we, we're doing 12 hours a day today. The first day here at Benzinga, we've done a full 12 hours. Shout out to Ruel oh. for, for coming in, closing us out. We normally talk and stocks. Also, we also talk cryptos. Yeah, just show, show us what else. Please uh, add my uh, channel, my YouTube channel. I do weekly stock videos, and we also go over crypto picks. It's uh, Black Rue Investing. As you can see here. Um, yep, so I, I do weekly stock videos and stuff. And of course, we got this show, uh, awesome show, great, 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 great um, opportunity from Benzinga. Much love and appreciation for that. And uh, hopefully next week we'll hit you with something new. Um, if there's anything you guys want to see, I'll watch the show over again. Please put in some uh, comments about anything that you would like to see in the crypto or stocks, any type of subject for the next couple shows. I'll do some research and I'll come back with as much as I can know or find. Boom. All right. There we have it, guys. Closing out the marathon day. Ruel, thanks for joining us. Producer AB, thanks for thanks hanging guys. out all day as always. Yes, sir. And again, trading, hit subscribe, 8 a.m. Eastern. We'll be back at it. That's just what? Less than 12 hours from now. 11 hours, 57 minutes. We'll be back here hanging out, talking ideas. Peace. Happy trading, guys.